again, everybody, and welcome to another edition of the Jim Cornette Experience. It's another one of those type of shows, folks. We may not know where it's going to end up. Technical difficulties, crashing ratings, crushing boredom in the Hall of Shame. It's a typical week in modern wrestling, and we're going to be talking about some of it. And to join me, Hawaiian Brian, the podcasting lion, the king of the Arcadian Vanguard Podcast Network, Mr. Co-host to you. His ratings are high, and so is he, the great Brian Last, everybody. Aloha, Jim. A pleasure to be here once again. Time to have high wrestling talk with, of course, Mr. Happy himself, Jim Cornette. How's the weather up there, Ollie? It's a little cold. You just gave, you told me that you had a wide variety of forecasts going on up there in the great white north. You might get a little snow or you might get a lot of snow. What are they saying to you? On the morning news today here on CBS in New York, I said that in a really weird way, but I'll continue on. <laughs> what happened was the guy said that we're probably going to get half an inch of snow, but some forecast from like an international pool of weather people. I don't even know who does this. The, the international weather pool. Well, they said it could be up to five feet, but he didn't think that was going to happen. So a half an inch to five feet is the forecast range for your snowfall. That's right. It's also the uh, Vince McMahon biography name. Half an inch to five feet. All right. Well, let get back when, when Interpol or whoever gives us a more pinpoint razor-focused forecast. Interpol. Get back to us on that. Well, you know, the International Weather Pool, Interpol. That's the, for short. You see, they abbreviate these things. Why don't we abbreviate this program? Is it time to think you yet? Oh, it's one of those shows. Ooh, 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 ooh. Oh, boy. Well, they ain't giving us any help out there in the wrestling world on anything to talk about. Hey, we're going to play a new game here today on the program. I've, everybody, I've, I told you last couple of weeks I was feeling under the weather. I got finally got sick after almost three years. Battled back through that with the help of modern medicine and medication. I'm mostly back on my game. I'm still a little, a little laggy yet with the energy, but I'm mostly back on my game. Got a little every once in a while I'm clearing out, but I'm mostly back. But I also, while I was there at the doctor's office, I had the annual drawing of the blood to analyze that crucial substance and see if there's anything else wrong with me. I've said many times, there's got to be something wrong with me. I continue to baffle science. I don't know what the fuck this whole good health thing is about. And the blood test came back, Brian. I, I, we're going to play a game here on the program. You have known me for many, many years. Many years. I sound like Joe Franklin now. You've known me for many years. And you know my my eating habits for almost all of that time. And still to this day, even though that I'm not as portly as I used to be, it's not like I'm eating clean, as the boys used to say. Like I got the grilled, unseasoned chicken breast over here, the dry pasta and whatever them bodybuilders eat. So you know my diet. And, and you know my level of exercise or lack thereof, at least on purpose. I'm an active person, but I don't just do these repetitive motions that get me nowhere for nothing. Guess what my cholesterol is? That's the game. Guess Cornette's cholesterol. And, and for anybody who's not well-versed in this type of medicine, any cholesterol number over 200 is considered elevated. Guess what my cholesterol is, Brian Last? 190. You son of a bitch. It's 191. God damn, I get that. Come on, I get that. No one would have said one. But, but still. Another point the, for me. That's the fucking point is you're supposed to say knowing what the, the double cheeseburgers with mayonnaise and extra cheese and the fucking wings and the gravy. And the grease and John Wayne's mama and all that stuff that you've ingested over the years. You you were supposed to say something like 280 or something like that. And instead, you you come within a point, a gimme, ruined the whole bit. I didn't go with my heart. I went with my brain. I was going, well, 
In that case, if I were you, I would uh, seek a refund. Um, <laughs> all right. How much did I weigh then at the official weigh-in? When was the weigh-in? The way well was it was. What was I've lost track of time. What I got sick on the Sunday of Thanksgiving weekend, and I I went to the doctor on that Tuesday. So November thirty-ish. What are you wearing? You wearing underwear? Not in front of the goddamn nurse. We barely know each other. So what are you wearing on the she, scale? Uh, she she kept her bra on. What are you wearing on the scale? You just wearing your entire wardrobe and your sneakers? No, I've I've got I've got my tennis shoes on and I've got my sweatpants and I got my t-shirt. I didn't dress up to go to the doctor when I was ill. Oh, yeah, and well, and my and my face mask, of course. For that's there's two ounces right there. What shirt are you wearing? Oh, forgot a t-shirt. A t-shirt? Like a cornet face shirt or just a different no, shirt? No, I'm not wearing my own face to the doctor. I already had my face with me. <laughs> Swear to God. I dare you to wear it to the doctor. <laughs> I All like right. to wear thank you, fuck you, bye to the doctor, but I don't want to piss him off just in case I need him at some point. If I'm wearing a goddamn t-shirt, a pair of sweatpants, a pair of tube socks, my tennis shoes, and a face mask. 194. <laughs> 187 pounds. Wow. I cracky. Cause I had I hadn't eaten in two days because I'd been sick. Cause I'd had a couple packages of Ritz crackers. And I believe I that that's the Monday, the Tuesday after the Monday that I started out the program last week. I shit myself three times on Monday. So I was kind of artificial. I was proud of that because that's such a bizarre number for me to see on a scale. But I'm i I have a feeling I'm I've probably rehydrated and re burger meated up to about 190 at this point. I need to lower my glucose six points. When was the last time you weighed 187? Before now? Uh, 1981, maybe? Wow. Maybe? I'm not sure. So like the, the liver king said the secret to his success was eating raw animal organs and testicles, and it turned out the Zahorian special. For you, do you think the secret to... Because you're healthier than just about every single one of your contemporaries that wrestled. <laughs> the secret is just eat whatever the fuck you want. Don't give a shit. And then maybe, you know, tighten it up a little bit in your 50s. Possibly. It, that may be, now that you mention it, because that's pretty much what a god did. I, qu I quit the sugar in 2007 and went to the uh, Sprite Zeros. And that, that helped quite a bit, but I still was doing the aggravation eating and the binge eating and the deprivation of sleep and the whole nine yards on the road and various things that we've talked about. But I finally tightened everything up, as you said. Boy, that's a kind of a nice way to put it. Uh, about, about three or four years ago, I started tightening and I've, I've tightened myself up into a goddamn healthy situation. I don't understand. I, and I'll, I'll walk out of the garage and a fucking tree's going to fall on me tonight. Just so you know. So it's been nice knowing you, Brian. Um, well, we'll carry on. Don't worry. Well, I can't do this fucking transition. I was about to say, and hey, con congratulations to Jeremy Bagley. His dad's been sick, but he's feeling better. I don't, God damn, is that, is that a bad transition? It's a good one no, considering the topic because you always kill his parents on the show. Well, no, but, na well, no, the Bagleys, the Bagleys are battlers. They're, they're too mean for death, apparently. Uh, Jeremy says his mother, who was worried about his dad, obviously she's been, kicking ass at the hospital and all the doctors have been amazing and he's had a bunch of people on social media uh wish him well and everything and, and but it, that again in the middle of this this has been going on because we mentioned his dad was sick uh, a couple months ago he's still doing the cancer fundraiser the, so he's got all this shit going on I don't want to say shit like that, but he's got illness in the family and his mother's worried about his fight. He's worried about his father. But at the same time, he started this cancer fundraiser in honor of your dad and so many different people in the cult. And, you know, my mom, Donna Eaton, Dennis Condry at various points, you know, all these Bobby Fulton. So 
that's cool. And I wanted to plug that again one more time. He's at Jacked Up Jeremy on Twitter. Or they do the uh, the Facebook thing on the Cult of Cornet group or what? I don't know how to give these links, but if but he's raised several thousand dollars, and I'm retweeting a bunch of these also. Um, but that shows you how thoughtful a person that old jacked up Jeremy is, and uh, you wouldn't th see he's tightened it up because he used to be just a complete uncir uh, uncircumcised prick. Who just said a that? surly individual. I've no, never, he I've was never heard anyone say that. Oh, he was a badass in his younger days. He was mean, boy. To meaner than a rattlesnake and tougher than a hollow-eyed scorpine. But he's tightened it up. Now he's thinking about other people. Well, thank you for all you do, despite everything Jim says. Well, and some and he's he's trying to prove me wrong. See, I'm motivating you. I'm doing the William Regal thing. I'm I'm motivating him by saying complete nonsense that nobody understands. We'll get into that on the AEW review, um, which won't be very long this week. I promise. I want to talk about something you wouldn't let me talk about on your program last week. You shit on it. You, you, you took your hand and you reached around and you fucking fired off a chocolate rocket right in the palm of it and you slapped me in the face with it. I said to you before we went on the air for your show last week, hey, Brian, have you been watching the new season of The Curse of Oak Island? And you said, no. I said, well, can we talk about it? No, I ain't seen it. Don't want to see it. Don't know what it is. Don't care. <laughs> just right on it. Just right there. Just, just. I didn't make the noises, but everything else you said is accurate so far. Yeah, well, see, you should make some more sound effects and it'd go along well with every. There's also a uh, documentary on Max Steiner on Turner Classic Movies, if you find that. One of the most prolific uh, movie scorers and uh, musicians of all time. But anyway, I'm going to talk about it now because it's my show. Have you yet caught up on the new season of The Curse of Oak Island, Tuesday nights on the History Channel? I'm backed up on every single show I actually want to watch. I, I've not caught up on your show yet, no. It just... <sighs> How dismissive. Do you even know what I'm talking about? Are you aware of the premise of this? It's been going on for 10 years. I'm not aware of the show. I know what the History Channel is, and I've watched other fine programming on the History Channel, but I have not watched The Curse of Oak Island. No, this is not like, you know, did aliens fuck Bigfoot and make Ted Cruz or whatever. Some of their shows are a little bit caca. But this is a fine program. They've gone to great lengths to do this. Are you aware of the legend of the money pit on Oak Island in Nova Scotia? Vaguely. <sighs> well, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, since Brian ain't gonna take this ride with me, there's an island in the North Atlantic. That's the way they open the show. I have been hearing about this since I was 10 or 11 years old, when I got this book, and I have this book right here, right in my hand, because it sits on my shelf. Hear that? That's that book. The World's Strangest Mysteries by Rupert Furno. F-U-R-N-E-A-U-X. He's either French or phony, one or the other, because I can't believe anybody would actually name anybody that. But this book, which I purchased... When I was a kid with Mama Cornette going to flea markets and used bookstores looking for comic books and other collectibles, is, is, it contains startling new revelations about 26 of the most mystifying scientific and historical enigmas that have baffled experts and laymen alike. So how in the world is an 11-year-old kid not going to want to read this book, right? Yeah. And... As you open it up, the very first story is The Money Pit. And I, re I was reading this in 1971. The book's from 1961, but I was 10 when I got it. And it is the story of this little island. I can't remember. They talk about the area of it on the show, but it, let's, it, it might be 100, 120 acres. It's like the size of a farm. Small farm, even. But on this little island on, you know, off the edge of Nova Scotia, for 200 and something years, people have been digging in this area, which they call, they named years ago, the Money Pit. And it started by in the late 1700s. Uh, the legend is, the story is, where it's been documented 
so far. These three guys from across the bay saw lights on this island and went over to investigate and saw this big depression in the ground under an old oak tree. And there were signs on the oak tree that somebody had been using ropes or pulleys or whatever to blah, blah, blah. So they start digging in this thing for the fuck of it. And once they, every 10 or 15 feet or whatever the measurements are, they start finding like a layer of oak beams and then some other kind of material that's not necessarily native to the island and all this stuff. I'm not going to sit here and tell the whole story. It's goddamn 10 seasons in on the television program. I'm going to try to encapsulate the next 200 years fairly quickly. They kept finding shit that indicated that somebody had dug a hole and put something in it. And once that they couldn't go any further because there's some jack-off teenagers, but they start running their mouths, over the years, other people have tried to excavate this area. And it got so ridiculous that even in the early 1900s, Franklin Roosevelt was part of a team that went up there. They, they've organized, companies have organized, you know, various digging methods. And people over the years have bought up land on this island trying to find out what was going on. And six people have died digging these shafts into this pit and surrounding area trying to figure out what the fuck was going on and what might be down there. So apparently now these two guys named Rick and Marty Lagina, who apparently I haven't researched their goddamn curriculum, but apparently they're fairly well to do in business and they've like everybody else involved in this thing. They've heard these rumors and these legends and they decided to start getting to the bottom of it. And at the same time, they made a reality show out of this search and this procedure that they're going through which is apparently, because it's a hit show, has made enough money that now they can just spend any goddamn amount of money they want to to research this entire island, and you should see the things they have. I don't even care if they ever find anything now in the way of treasure or whatever, because this has been the most fascinating process you'll ever see. They, there's a swamp that they believe was a man-made swamp that may have they may have sunk a ship there after they deposited whatever they deposited. So they drained this swamp and they found stone roads, carbon dating and, and being dated back hundreds of years, elaborate stone roads, a, a, a giant wharf area. They've uncovered in this, through various drilling methods and, and uh, ground samples and scientific methodology they've found timbers and shafts not only from the past couple of hundred years but 70 100 feet under the ground with timbers from the 15 and 1600s and all of these other you know things from this from the bay where a ship would come up and all this elaborate stonework hundreds of years old and roads leading up the hill to where this area is and timbers from 500 years ago in, in under the ground uh, over 100 feet deep. What the fuck was going on on this fucking island? And, it, and that's what they have yet to, but it's a fascinating search, and they use every type of scientific technique and heavy machinery. They put a goddamn coffer dam around the beach and uncovered that you know, several hundred year old wharfing area uh, that had been underground for 200 years because they dammed off the whole goddamn ocean. It's an amazing, and now they got the big shit coming in this season and they're actually restoring a, like an eight by eight foot shaft, a hundred and something feet deep in the ground so that people can actually go down in there and look around. So what's your theory? What do you think happened after watching all this? Or what do, this, what do you think is going on? I don't even know how to phrase the question. Well, they've they've tied the legend, and they've of course you can do research that validates any theory. But the working theme is that the Knights Templar were behind because and the Portuguese, and because they were seafarers in the 14, 1500s and blah blah blah. 
And the theory is that either some type of uh, religious artifacts or priceless treasure of that description or just monetary gains from the Crusades and the Middle Ages were deposited somewhere with the thought that people would come back later on or that at least it would be preserved and there were clues left and various things. But the problem also that they find is that so many people over the last 200 years have been so ham-fisted in these goddamn digging, you know, efforts and, and just, they've just, basically it was practically strip mined this whole area and none of the clues or old maps or whatever the fuck they've either been removed or don't fit anymore or there was one stone that supposedly inscriptions were on that was found like 80 feet down and it ended up sitting in a fucking window of an antique shop for in the you know early 1900s until it disappeared nobody ever actually modern tested it all this shit so they're just they're going in there trying to figure out what the fuck and again it it's awfully far fetched that there'd be but then they they find a concentration of gold actually in the groundwater around this area that they're digging that doesn't exist you know just half mile away on the other part of the island what the fuck's that about and there's been they found a kind of a booby trapping drain system where if you get to a certain depth in the pit, it will automatically fill up with water that's apparently been French drained into it from the, you know, from the bay in some respect and booby trapped. So that, that foiled people for years and years and years. The point is there's some shit under there that would have required a lot of people, a lot of time to either do this stone construction of roads on an island for what, and a wharf area of hundreds of years ago for fucking what, there, there's nothing on the island now except their operation. And all this other shit that, that predates the 200 years that it's been alleged that people are trying to look for this shit. What the fuck was somebody doing on this island that deep underground and that with that many people and that elaborately in the 1600s or, or early 1700s and nobody just bothered to ever know about? Does it inspire you to do some digging on the property? I've dug a hole in almost every part of this fucking property. And I'll tell you, especially when we were trying to find where that new spring was coming from. Um, I don't think that there's any any major work to be uncovered here at the castle. But I loved that shit when I was a kid. I That was in my... Well, you're not old enough. But you... Well, you remember reruns of the TV series In Search Of, right? Actually, I don't, no. You don't? In Search Of was a syndicated TV show in the early 70s that was taking advantage of the... the it was kind of a combination craze of aliens and mysteries. Because that was when, oh, God damn it. Um, um, shit. What was the name of the book now that started the whole thing? The We Are Not Alone craze with all of the alien books of the early 70s. Help me out on this because I've got a whole fucking wall of them, but I can't see. I don't have my glasses on and the wall is around the corner. I'm no uh, Zachariah Sitchin. I'm no expert on this world um, of aliens and stuff. Well, know. no, it, but here's the thing. It started with the NASA program, the space, the moon program. And finally, you know, Apollo 11, we land on the moon in 1969. I actually, I got to stay up late to see that live on TV. Like everybody else in the world, that's, it was like the moon landing ratings. That's where that phrase came from. Cause everybody in the world watched it on television that had a TV. And then shortly thereafterwards, the TV series and the book started coming out ancient alien intervention in the human race and uh, chariots of the gods eric von daniken thank you i just did it must chariots of the gods was the first book that brought this fucking phase on and i swear to god for two or three years you could not go into a bookstore or drugstore with a paperback rack or whatever without seeing the latest 
theory on ancient aliens and then it spread to the mysteries of the Sphinx and the pyramids and who did that and did the aliens help with the pyramids? And it was a whole fucking deal. And I loved that shit because I've, I've told you when I was a kid how much I read, right? And especially, I have no job and before I started doing the photography and in summertime, not have to go to school at all, I could read three or four books a week. And I would plow through these things. And that was a, a phase. And, a, and, and even then, you could tell that, even then, you could, even then, I could tell, you know, I'm 12 or 13 by then or whatever. I've still got all those books, obviously. And they're in a special section in the vault. But I could differentiate between the ones that were taking advantage of the craze and the ones that were just complete bullshit. And the the better ones that at least had some validity, some type of facts, and some type of, okay, we cannot explain this, and we're looking for a suitable explanation. We're not saying that it had to be supernatural, that kind of thing. I mean, there's some... It, it's ridiculous to believe that this is as good as it gets on Earth, right? In the entire fucking universe, there is not some other form of intelligent life form that has either come farther, got it right better, or, you know, done something better than, yeah, here we are, walking down the street. So, you know, I could believe that versus the man-made legends of supreme beings and religions and etc that we ourselves have come up with because that would involve human intervention because humans are the only thing on this planet but if there's something else out well, there's, there there's other animals on the planet for the record well i mean the only ones that are building the skyscrapers and running plumbing companies but now if if there's something out there and 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 that is where those legends began we just couldn't get it must be god because he was a ball of light and came down to the ground and fucking did all this supernatural shit if that's where it came from i could buy it but if it was just completely human invention uh on the you know then yeah no I, then I guess we're just as good as we're, as it gets. So the aliens visit islands in Canada and country roads in Tampa. That's your argument. Well, no, country roads can take you home three hours later than you belonged. But whether that has to do with aliens or vodka, the point is... is Alien that, Vodka, that's a great company name yeah, right there. There you go. There are things... If you ever go back in the woolly swamp, well, you better not go at night because there's things out there in the middle of them woods that make a strong man die of fright. Things that crawl and things that fly and things that creep around on the ground. And they say the ghost of Lucius Clay gets up and he walks around. Brian, last, there's stuff in this world you just can't explain. Can I ask you a question real quick that yes. uh, came up while you were saying all that? <laughs> Everyone loves the Twilight Zone. It's on every night on MeTV. There's a marathon, at least one every year on cable. It's still popular. People still talk about it. There are books about it. Do you think The Outer Limits gets the shaft? <sighs> Boy, you know, I loved The Outer Limits when I was a kid, when it was... I, I wasn't cognizant of the original network airings. I'm not quite that old. To understand that, but the first few rounds of syndication I was there for, and boy, and the music and the control voice, we will control all you see and hear. That was cool. There were episodes of The Outer Limits, uh, Bradbury adaptations, uh, oh gosh, what was the, the one with, um, God damn it, the one with uh, Robert Vaughn, where he advanced, his brain advanced. What was the title of it? Never, there were great episodes, but there was also some hokey-ass fucking, <laughs> you know, B-movie 50s sci-fi costume reject monsters on there also that kind of hindered sometimes as you go back as an adult and enjoy some of those episodes. But um, 
But yeah, the outer limits does because it hadn't been as widely. And here's something else. It gets the shaft, Boris Karloff's Thriller. Because there were some great episodes of that. Plus, he uh, opened. You think Michael Jackson ep- stole the spark from Boris no, Karloff's Thriller? No, God damn it. Uh, Karloff opened every episode. He appeared in a number of them. There were several classic episodes of that program, and it only ran two seasons, and it doesn't get the the syndication love it deserves. But yeah, The Outer Limits is often overlooked. But when it's when it's good, it's very good, and when it's bad, it's it's caca. Anyway, did you ever go through a? Fra- I went through phases of stuff I would read because I've always been into nonfiction. Me Except too. for, you know, a few Stephen King novels and things of that nature. But, it, like I said, I went through that phase uh, of the, you know, alien intervention and Earth's mysteries and the pyramids and the Sphinx and the Seven Wonder and blah, blah, blah. And then, obviously, uh, wrestling got in there very heavily. But then, by the time that I got into business... Yeah, I've always had to read on the plane to forget that I was on a fucking plane or read in hotel rooms, and I did the true crime thing. And then we just went again. That was the early 80s and mid 80s were the heyday of the true crime and uh, serial killer biography books and Helter Skelter and Zodiac and the whole nine yards. And I couldn't get enough of those. And I've still got a whole wall of those in there. And, uh, you know, and that was, uh, but then. It, I would overdose on shit. I would get so interested in a subject that then it would start getting repetitive and I would have read almost everything there was and then I would fall across a new topic to get interested in or whatever. Or do you just bounce willy-nilly around from your your reading choices? No, I mean, I'm pretty specific in that I've always been mostly nonfiction. Very little fiction that I seek out. The stuff I do, I usually end up enjoying. Confederacy of Dunces is my favorite book ever, and that's fiction, and there's an amazing story behind that. No, I'm an obsessive reader. If, I, if there's a topic I'm specifically interested in, I'll get every single book that covers it, so I read every single perspective. And if it's just something I'm lightly interested, I'll get a book just so I can read about it, and then I always have multiple books going at once. I have a downstairs book, I have a library book, I have an upstairs book, I have a bathroom book. <laughs> There's a book in various There's parts of the house that I'm working a on. Book. So, Ian, so you and I are both pretty fucking anal. Also, and I didn't even mention, as we've talked about before, and you have a giant collection of movie, entertainment books, radio, television, entertainers, histories, biographies, the business side, music business, et cetera, et cetera. We... We read too much. I, I can honestly say there's very few people probably in the country that have as big a library of that stuff as I do. Wait a minute. Now, just hold on here one second. Yeah, I'll hold on for two seconds. Are you trying to compare the size of yours with the size of mine? I wasn't making about me versus you. I was making about me versus everybody. Yeah, well, just don't don't group me and I'll have to take my big fucking wingding and whack you in the fucking head with it. I've got a giant wingding over here so big I don't even know if I could whack you with it. I'll I'll put the I'll number, need help. I'll put the number of books and periodicals and magazines and newspapers and related written material under this roof up against anything that's not a public library in the country. I feel the same way. Let's start by weighing everything. You know, hey, you know what? When I moved from <laughs> Connecticut. <laughs> When I moved from Connecticut back to Louisville, they said it was the heaviest private home they'd ever moved. Oh, and it's bigger now. And it's a lot bigger now. And and there was practically, I didn't bring any of the furniture because I could give a shit, right? I just brought the books and the, uh, all right. But they're you the know, big, here's, a, they're the biggest boy. pain in the ass in a move. If you're a book collector and someone who actually loves having a library at home, to pack everything up and then once you get them boxed up, you're like, oh shit, this is a heavy fucking box. Yes. I have like 50 more of these I got to do. That's why you hire movers, but even well, with and, the movers, and it's a then pain in the you ass. you anguish. Not only are the cover are the corners going to get blunted, or is some going to get ripped, or then is the is it going the moving truck? I'm not going to see this shit for three days. Is it going to be too hot? The shit is the humidity. Is, is you know it's a nightmare. 
All righty. Speaking of nightmares, you know what's coming up? Uh, I guess they'll hear this before. Tuesday night. Tuesday night at the Gardens. Uh, Tuesday night on Vice is the Vince McMahon documentary. And now I've seen an actual commercial for it, and I'm in it. <laughs> I at least have one on-camera comment, which is basically... Um, it was from a uh, Dark Side of the Ring shoot that we did last season. Uh, I, I recognized my shirt and the camera angle. So I don't know what else I'm going to say in it because we talked about we talk about all kinds of things when we do the sit down interviews. And uh, but I still haven't seen a screener or know what to, I think Brian Solomon's in it. Uh, That's right. The wrestling news is Brian Solomon. Yes, he he just uh, tweeted that, that he's been assured that he was not left on the cutting room floor. He's been on more floors than Johnson's Wax. Oh, will you Ryan stop Brian Solomon. Leave but, him alone. So anyway, so we'll all be watching together to see what the fuck they're going to say about Vince and what the fuck that any of us said about him. Uh, but that's on Vice, 9 to 11 Eastern on Tuesday night. And uh, and Vince won't even know how to turn on the TV to find it. So If, if he does, it may, <laughs> I hope he remembers the guy showed him where the mute button is. <laughs> and for the 16 people who remember that story, we'll move oh, on. Oh, you've told it several times, more than 16. All right, then 32. Um, we got plans, uh, you and I, for, for Christmas, for extra programming for the fine folks, the people, the cult of Cornet out there. We're gonna do, we're gonna do shows, folks. But also, we're gonna get on the bus. We're gonna have compilations. We're gonna have greatest hits of things. What are we gonna have, Brian? As as the minions are preparing these things. Well, we're not going to officially announce what's coming and when, but there are a series of omnibuses in the works that are going to be coming over the next few weeks. So stay tuned for that. They'll be on YouTube and in the podcast feed, and we'll see how we feel. We may finally put that giant Cody omnibus in the podcast feed, which we've never done before. Well, for we don't want to overfeed our podcast feed. That's a, that's a long one. Well, people are home. It's the holidays. They need well, lots that's... of feed. Well, then we're going we're gonna to feed you folks for the holidays. You're going to be fed up with us by the time that you get finished listening to all of these things that we have planned for the holidays to make sure people don't forget about our lonely little show. And uh, speaking of the holidays, I, I, I've implored you for the past few weeks now to please go to jimcornette.com and order anything that you would want by Christmas by the time that you hear this. That time has already passed. Um, if you haven't already ordered... Domestic orders may still make it over the next day or two, but uh, remember there's a couple days from the time I hand it to the feather bottoms till the time they can work their magic and get it in the mail stream. I will say the good news is all orders for everything through December the 10th have already been signed and have given been given to the feather bottoms by the time that you hear this. And within the next couple of days all that will be making its way to the mail stream, and I uh, made a mistake, or actually Hotchkiss did. It was a clerical error. I said on the drive through we had oversold a number of cornet face shirts. Apparently, Hotchkiss counted something twice, and we came out even. You can't really get any more, but we didn't fuck anybody either. So we got that going for us. So cornet face shirts are sold out, but they're still... The lazy booking t-shirts that are available all, along with the few remaining raw variant action figures, some Santa cornies, Christmas variants remaining books, DVDs, pictures, and etc. at jimcornette.com. After the next couple days, if you still want the stuff, you can order it. But I would not want to promise you that it will be there to come down your chimney with Santa. It may come down your chimney on New Year's. Depends on what you do on New Year's Eve. If you puke in your fireplace, we're not coming down your chimney. Do you like coming down a chimney where people have puked in the fireplace? I'm Jewish. I celebrate Hanukkah. I avoid the chimney. Do people puke for Hanukkah or just for New Year's? Uh, some people. I used to know a few kids that would drink too much Manischewitz and they'd puke all over the place. Oh, boy, I bet that's hard to get out, too. Even if you use Bonami. All righty then. We got a couple of emails here for my, where are they? I got them next to my heart, 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 heart. Oh, here he is, my back pocket. 
Scott Teal at crowbarpress.com. And we love Scott, and he does such incredible historical research, and he's done the the uh, definitive Madison Square Garden record book, and he's done so many record books on so many great wrestling cities, and just blah, blah, blah. And he has a, a host of people he works with that do a lot of this research, but Scott himself sent me, I don't want to leave anybody out, but at the same time, I don't want to start naming people because then I'll leave them out. But he doesn't do it all by himself, but he did this, by God. Scott sent me this from research he's been doing, and it, it addresses, a lot of people have always, you know, are saying about the pioneer days of wrestling, I wonder when they first started working, or I wonder when, you know, there, since the dawn of time, I bet you they were working in the Roman Colosseum. Not the Lions, maybe. But I guarantee you, from the dawn of any combat sport, there has been a work of various kinds. But this is a different kind that I've ever heard of. This is from the St. Louis Globe Democrat. Two articles. The first one, Sunday, March 7th, 1915. And the headline is, Turk to go to mat with Armenian to end race dispute. Subtitled, Question of National Superiority to be Decided by Wrestling Bout. Where is this? This is St. Louis, the Globe Democrat newspaper, Sunday, March 7th, 1915. The East St. Louis Turks and Armenians have agreed to settle disputes which have been waged for years by means of a wrestling bout between a trained representative of each nationality to be held tonight at the Broadway Theater. It is to be understood that the people of the losing wrestler's nationality will admit the superiority of the nationality to which the winner belongs. The bout will take place at the Broadway Theater at 8th Street and Broadway. A stake of $100, which in 1915, so today would, would that be five grand, whatever, has been put up, which will go to some charitable enterprise. Alio Bashir, 195 pounds, a Turk, will represent his people in the arena, and Monik Gurgian, 215 pounds, will represent the Armenians. Both are employees of the Missouri Malleable Iron Company, and the hundreds of employees of iron foundries on the east side, besides residents of the two colonies themselves, are expected to attend. So this is, it, it, if, the, if the, we buried the lead at the start, but basically there had been racial dispute in St. Louis among the Turks and the Armenians, not oh. just <laughs> wrestling. Well, no, it's, it's, this is right at the, what was the date? This is right before World War One, beyond World right, War One. No, right. Well, actually, before we got in it, but World War One was actually going on. Yes, but this is right before the Turks slaughtered the Armenians. This is right before the yes. genocide. And but it, it, it this it actually we think okay, it wasn't happening in St. Louis, but no, they're hot in St. Louis. There's Turks and Armenians that are hot at each other in St. Louis. Is the point I'm trying to make. Yes. And there was a Vince and, McMahon and looking yeah. to take advantage of that. Well, hold on. Hold on here now. Because, so basically, there's been real-life problems between these two groups of people in this city. And now, apparently, somehow, because a bunch of them, and an article I'm going to read you in a second, uh, quantifies some of them, but a bunch of them worked in, there were iron foundries on the east side, and a bunch of those people were either Turkish or Armenian or both or new people or whatever. And so some way or another, you can tell by reading between the lines, somebody has come along and ginned up the idea in this, in these iron company, in this iron company, well, by God, let's have a wrestling match. And it's like a, real life kiss by foot match the winner's race is better and these people have all agreed to this right and they have nominated a uh, uh 
Hold on. It is understood the VP oh, between a trained representative of each nationality. That's what they're calling them. A trained representative. A trained representative of each nationality, but both are employees, as it's described later, of the Missouri Malleable Iron Company. And so hundreds of these people that worked in these foundries were going to show up, and the Turks were going to show up, and the Armenians were going to show up, and the winner was going to be the better race. So that was... <clears throat> Who supplied me. security? Boy, I'd like to know. <laughs> I don't know if Atlas Security could have handled that one. But now that was Sunday, March 7, 1915. The match was supposed to happen that night. Well, here is a follow-up article from the St. Louis Post-Dispatch on March 19, 1915, which was 12 days later, right? And the headline is, Turks champion wrestler said to be Armenian. There you go. Subtitled East St. Louis racial feud reported to be near outbreak as result of discovery. <laughs> Story. There is much excitement in the Turkish colony of East St. Louis, and there is a fear that the old race feud between the 600 Turks and the 150 Armenians of that district may be renewed after lying dormant for the past fortnight. And I believe that's two weeks, right? Which is about since the fucking match, right? It continues, The Armenians are charged with having played the sons of Turkey falsely. This is the way the story goes. Feeling has run high ever since the outbreak of the war, and about three months ago it took the form of a free-for-all battle in which 14 of the combatants were injured. So they'd had a fight between the Turks and the Armenians, and a bunch of people got hurt. He says, and uh, he says, it continues, Finally, it was decided that each tribe pick its David or its Goliath who would settle all tribal disputes by a wrestling match at the Broadway Opera House. And it gives, it gives different fucking names of the wrestlers than the original remember the original uh, article said alio bashir and monik gurgian right well this says ali georgian that's so an armenian name that's i don't think that, i don't think any of this i don't think the guy at either of these newspapers knew how to spell these fucking names but ali gorgian no that's an armenian name what do you mean doesn't know how to spell okay. the name but no, because they're all different names. See, is what I'm saying to you. Is there kind of is Ali Gorgian? Was he Monik Gurgian in the other paper? Oh, oh, gotcha. That's gotcha. what I'm saying to you because he, it says Ali Gorgian was selected as the champion of the Armenians, and Higop Sarkisian, uh, lately come to East St. Louis, acclaiming acclaiming himself as the Turkish wrestler from Detroit was chosen by the Turks. <laughs> As so many have claimed before. So apparently there's a bit of a fucking swizz itch going on right before the match. Anyway, he got Sarkeesian won, and besides getting a $100 purse and the worship of his people... He was given an extra $60 as an expression of joy and thanksgiving from the Turks. Immediately thereafter, he left town. <laughs> Yesterday, an Armenian paper, remember, he got one for the Turks. Yay, Turks, go, Turks, go. Yesterday, an Armenian paper arrived from Boston heralding he got as the champion Armenian wrestler of America and telling at great lengths of he got's victory in East St. Louis. Despite their pleadings of innocence, the Armenians are accused of arranging the match, one Armenian against another, in which the cause of Armenia had no chance of losing. There is a general feeling of strife in the air. <laughs> That's amazing. So this guy was going to, from fucking town to town... And whichever side that either needed to win, wanted to win, or he could make the money on, he was a Turk, or he was an Armenian, or he, he could be Russian. He could be whatever you wanted him to be. 1915. Anyway, thank you, Scott Teal, for... That's amazing, just because that, the history of the Turks and Ar the Armenians over there 
not over here in St. Louis or in any other state, there was a lot going on. And there's still hard feelings to this day, as there should be. But this is right in the midst of that. So when I brought up security, I was half joking, but half like, seriously, if a third of the crowd is the Turks and a third of the crowd are the Armenians and a third of the crowd are just the people at the factory, like, oh, some shit's going to go down. (laughs) Who's stopping anyone from 14 people got hurt out of how many fighting? Yeah, okay. apparently it was a nice size hey rube. Well, and it said this, there's 600 Turks and 150 Armenians in that East St. Louis district. So it sounds like the Turks had the advantage anyway. So the fucking most people wanted to see the Turk win. So the Turk won and he got all the prize money and they fucking carried him out. But then they go to Boston. Maybe there's, it's an Armenian paper in Boston. There's more Armenians. Suddenly the Turk that won in St. Louis is the champion Armenian wrestler of America. Brilliant booking. That's wild. What else? I mean, is Scott doing research on this guy for a project? Because I would actually like to read more about this. I I just just get anything Scott does. I have everything he's ever done. No, I'm I'm telling the broader people out there, or even the narrower people, (laughs) skinny, fat, whatever the fuck you are, read Scott Teal shit. It's most may he finds. Well, we'll we'll talk. I've been wanting to talk about another one of his books for ages and ages, but too many stupid people do things in current day that we have to comment on. Well, Jim, while not that fake Turk, you worked with the Turk, right, in Memphis? No, no, he was there in 1981, the Turk and El Toro. Yeah. uh, They were there in 81. I was still a photographer. But in 82, I worked with the monk, and the monk looked like a Turk. The monk? He was was bald. (laughs) The guy came in. I don't know from where, and I'm not sure where he went to. But this guy, and there, he was, wasn't a bad guy. He was just crazy as a rainbow trout in a car wash. And he was bald headed and kind of ugly faced. And he was the monk, and he wore a, like a monk outfit, you know, the robe and the rope belt and everything. And just these black tights. And, he, and he's kind of a punch and kick guy. But his big thing was he told Jimmy Hart, he said, You can hit me in the stomach with a baseball bat. What? Yeah, I'm going to show how tough I am. So the, he comes in and he gets like a win or two on TV. And then Lawler booked him against Lawler for the Southern heavyweight title on the undercard of the Jerry Lawler, Andy Kaufman match, because it, 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 they kind of weren't sure how it was going to go. And and it, it wasn't like Lawler needed to be advertised against just Andy Kaufman and not a, a legitimate match. Right. So he he books himself against the monk for the Southern title earlier in the show. So he's got a legitimate wrestling match and then the foolishness with the comedian later. And it lasted nine seconds because they locked up and the monk backed him up in the ropes and punched Lawler and Lawler hit him with a right and knocked him out and pinned him one, two, three in nine seconds. But on the Saturday morning before the TV before that match, because the monk is like, Oh my gosh, I'm going to wrestle Jerry Lawler in the Memphis Mid-South Coliseum for the Southern title. They're really going to use me and push me. He has he does the interview where he tells Hart to hit him in the stomach with a baseball bat. And Jimmy winds up and hits that sub bitch with that bat. You hit sounded like somebody hitting fucking a stack of raw meat. <laughs> <laughs> and you saw the fucking guy's face. His life was flashing before his eyes, and he wanted to crumple, but he couldn't. But he he got in the back, had a fucking giant bruise across him, and was ready to throw up, and did that, and then got knocked out with one punch in nine seconds. But folks, I'll tell you what, if you've ever worked with a Turk or a monk or whichever one, and you want to remember what they look like, well, all you got to do is get one of the skylight frames. Christmas is here, folks, but Skylight Frames is shipping instantly every day, and you can still get them, and you can still make your family, your loved ones, your friends and neighbors happy. You can even make somebody that you hate miserable for the holidays by sending them a Skylight Frame with a picture of you giving them the finger in it. You can do whatever you want. It's America. And these things set up effortlessly, so you can give somebody the finger with no effort. If you go to Skylight Frames, you'll see skylightframe.com, I should say, and look at the Skylight Frames, you will see that they're beautiful black frames with a white mat, beautiful to display in any home, but 
It's not just one picture. It's all kinds of pictures because you can do a slideshow. You can add pictures, subtract pictures. Hey, if somebody gets excommunicated from the family Christmas dinner, yank their picture out of there. They're vanished in the ether. Put somebody else in there you really like. You can get the original 10-inch screen or the brand new large 15-inch screen or frame or screen frame or frame screen. One's 10, the other one's 15 inches. You'll easily tell the difference. And you can load photos on the Skylight Frame by just using the app and emailing them. They pop up in seconds. You'd use a touch screen to thank people when they send you pictures or to send them to other people. That hey, The Skylight Frames can even talk to each other. As a matter of fact, I predict within five years, most of the conversation amongst homes is going to come from skylight frames sending pictures to other skylight frames. So that's something we got to look forward to. You won't really have to speak to anybody. Just send them a picture of yourself. Let them know you're still breathing. And you can also, if you want to, go right now to skylightframe.com. That's S-K-Y-L-I-G-H-T-F-R-A-M-E.com. And use the promo code DRIVE and get $15 off your purchase of the aforementioned Skylight Frame. Just go to skylightframe.com, promo code DRIVE, save $15, and spread joy and happiness. Or misery, whatever you want to do. You want to send somebody, as a matter of fact, lull them into a false sense of security. Send somebody that you really want to get even with a Skylight Frame and load it up with all these pictures of Sunshine, lollipops, rainbows, waterfalls, puppy dogs, boxes of fluffy ducks, and then send them a close-up picture of your anus that'll just pop well, up on their wall. Don't just hit people right with in the surprise of, pictures of that, no. Right in the middle of Christmas dinner, some puckered sphincter just shows up on them. You could do that, I'm just saying, but most people don't. Well, now we know what to get you. But there's there's... Not enough room in the show to say all the nice things that people are saying about the Skylight Frame. You got to go to skylightframe.com and check them out for yourself and use the promo code DRIVE. And then just whatever you do from there, it's up to you. It's a free country and we're not ones to judge. Yes, all righty. Yes, you are. Well, but I, but I only do it to you. It's That's not, not like not... I, I do it out in public and judge people. Okay. Anyway, so the Louisville Gardens made a little news this week here in town, and some people picked up on it on Twitter and, and were uh, tweeting the, I don't know if it's news. I'm, I'm still waiting to hear you know, more details and that this is something that's actually going to happen because we've, we've heard this before around here in Louisville. Apparently, though, this time the plan is for the gardens to become converted into a film stage and then potentially offices because there are other ancillary offices and a floor in the uh, upper front of the gardens that could be used for offices and or things. But again, we've heard it before. At one time, they were going to revamp it as an arena. And then another time, they were going to for in some fashion, make it into high priced downtown condominiums. And then at another time, they, I think it was going to be a hotel slash entertainment complex with restaurants or something. And there's all kinds of grand plans that have been announced over the past 20 years now, but there, there were bare bones minimum details on this. It wasn't like a you know, an announcement out, we're breaking ground next week. This was another plan, but it was, so we'll, we'll cross our fingers, but I, I should mention, I guess, for the newer listeners or the people on the Isle of Malta, that the Louisville Gardens has been closed to events for the better part of the last 20 years. Uh, OVW, Ohio Valley Wrestling, we promoted the last dance there in June of 2001. That was when The Undertaker was in the main event because the building was closing to everything. And then, because it's still been owned by the city, for a few years after that, they would rent it out on a limited basis because they it's been a subject of 
sore feelings here in the community that they spend like almost a million dollars a year or some ridiculous amount just to keep the the electricity on and the bare minimum, you know, maintenance that the whole place doesn't fall in. It's in fairly bad disrepair. But they would rent it out a few times, and I promoted, as the local promoter, the last wrestling event that was held there, which was TNA, at, I believe, the either last part of 2006, first part of 2007. And at that time, that was the largest attendance that TNA had had at a house show. That's con also conveniently the only one I ever promoted for it. But nevertheless, anyway... And since then, there's been no, and I mean, at that point, we actually had to get toilet paper to put in the bathrooms. And, you know, it was on the verge of closing completely. And then we knew the end had come when they made Alvin move. Did I tell you that story, Brian? I don't know. The, the custodian, Alvin, the guy that had been the custodian of the Louisville Gardens since the, at least the 80s, I don't know if he'd been there before that. For several years after the gardens closed as a functioning full-time proposition, Alvin still lived in the basement. And it was spooky down there, boy. I mean, this is there's there was an underground place you could pull cars down underneath for like when Elvis had to leave the building in the 50s, that the Fabs used to bring their rats down. And but I mean, there were rats of of for the four legged variety down there long before Alvin moved, and there was it. It was a spooky looking situation, but he lived down there for you. And finally, they told him, "Now you you got to go." And that's when we knew they're not going to do anything else in there, right? And then in the intervening years, and the thing that's helped it, it's on the national I don't know National Register of Historic Place. It's got historic designation, whatever list it's on. So it can't really be torn down, but at the same time, they did investigate how much it would come because it sits right in the middle of downtown and they would have to do a lot of shit to tear this thing down that would affect traffic in a major, you know, business area in downtown because this is not like one of those arenas you can just blow up and implode across the streets, goddamn government buildings. And... I mean, across a, a narrow city street, not across the interstate, across a narrow city street is and businesses. And besides that, the walls are between two and three feet thick. They're concrete walls that were set. That building's 120 years old. It started out as the Jefferson County Armory. It wasn't a sports arena. It was to hold munitions and equipment for the precursor to the Kentucky National Guard. And there was shit in there that could potentially blow up. So it looked like originally a giant airplane hangar on the inside. And, uh, you know, so to tear that thing down would be insane. <clears throat> but the point is, and Brian, and I'm going to dare anybody out there, because I've said this before, but now we got a wider listenership. A lot more research has been done since the last time I said it. Is there another existing arena? in the United States of America that has hosted more live major league pro wrestling events in their history in the United States than the Louisville Gardens. Can you think of one? I think we've done this before and I couldn't come up with one. And that's, and I want to, I want to put that out there again to, uh, because I'm not even at this point, I'm not even trying to, you know, hometown the decision. But I can't think, you can't think. In the United States. In the United States. I'm, and I'm, and I, once again, I, I make the designation United States because we can talk about Arena Mexico. So, yes. Well, Clark and, and make, Hall, it's like five shows a day. Well, yeah. <laughs> and, I, and I also make the designation Major League Pro Wrestling because now over the last however many years, it's sprung up for, you know, little local, you know, independents to have their own building. But even then, I don't know if they could possibly compete. Because, okay, I want to take some history. We mentioned Scott Teal. Let's talk about our friend Mark James in Memphis, who uh, I did the Tuesday Night at the Gardens book with that centers on wrestling in the early 70s, the first part of the Jarrett run. But And John Cosper had helped with research also. But we did a piece on the history of the gardens and as a building and 
as a wrestling arena. And uh, like I said, it's it, the building's almost 120 years old. It was opened in 1905 as the Armory, and that was the name, the Jefferson County Armory. That's the name it had until the early 1960s. Um, at the time that it opened, as I'm looking at my notes here, it was not only the largest building or the largest armory in the state of Kentucky, it was the largest building in the state of Kentucky. And it stayed that way for quite some time. As a matter of fact, hold on, I'm zipping through to condense this a little bit. Do you know, and this is, again, this is an example of the proliferation of sports arenas in modern times where people just think it's always been like this. The armory in those days, before modern renovations made it a convention center, reduced seating capacity, put in skyboxes, or press boxes at least, I won't say skyboxes in the gardens, it could still seat about 9,000 people. That was the biggest arena in the state of Kentucky until Lexington got Memorial Coliseum for the University of Kentucky. So the only reason we ever had a building that could seat more than 9,000 people was because the UK basketball program got so hot. And then when Freedom Hall was opened in Louisville in 1957, that then became the biggest, 16,000 some seats, that was the biggest. And that replaced kind of the gardens as the premier arena in Louisville. But again, everybody was there, not just in wrestling, but I saw when I was a kid, the Harlem Globetrotters, Holiday on Ice, the Disney on Parade, the circus was there. I saw Earth, Wind, and Fire there the first time. Tickets were $7. That was the building that Roller Derby would do when Roller Derby came to town. But it was, you know, pretty much synonymous with wrestling because that had been the primary tenant of the building since they... they originally started right before the United States entered World War II with using the armory for gatherings of sporting events because that was the biggest indoor location that they could find. And the first wrestling show was in 1914. Stanislaus Zabisco was in the main event. I right, think about that. This is a building that Stanislaus Zabisco main evented the first wrestling show in it, and The Rock worked in it. They started doing a Derby Eve tradition of a wrestling event the night before the Kentucky Derby, and that was a big deal into on and off into the 50s. But, I mean, you know, it started in 1914, and then uh, Haywood Allen became the promoter full-time in 1935, and from that point, for over 20 years, wrestling was pretty much a fixture at the armory. The World War II years, they would switch over to a Columbia gym, which was a smaller or go outdoors at Swiss Park because the crowds, the available wrestlers, the available fans were smaller, but they still ran weekly shows uh, in whatever venue for most of that time. And then in the 40s, before television, the wrestling was so hot in Louisville, they were running the gardens almost every week. And that's when the seating capacity was bigger than it is in modern times. Pat Malone as the Green Shadow drew fucking big crowds there. Uh, while Bill Longson became the masked Superman. Because during World War II, they had a run of masked guys that got over in Louisville, so they kept repeating that formula. And Longson had been disqualified from military service because he'd had a broken back and Pat Malone was already in his 40s, but with the mask on, they couldn't tell. And, you know, the big unmasking of the heel became a thing. Um, Orville Brown unmasking Superman. Oh, I'm sorry. Superman 1 was Hans Schnabel. Superman 2 was Longson. Uh, but Orville Brown unmasking Superman drew 7,000 people. And that was the same car. The, remember the Mildred Burke and Elvira Snodgrass legend? The legend, yes. The legend was... How many people did it draw? Legendarily? 8, 18,000 people for a 1941 match with Mildred Burke and Elvira Snodgrass. And Joe Jarrett in the book 
Whatever Happened to Gorgeous George in 1973 reported that uh, with the list of big gates and crowds in wrestling history. And that became a thing that people started repeating. Well, they did draw 18,000 people in Louisville, but it was over three shows. <laughs> They never had a, there was no outdoor event. There was no place that could hold 18,000 people, but Burke and Snodgrass had three matches in Louisville that year and they all drew 6,000 people. So methinks that Billy Wolf started inflating that to make Mildred sound better. Anyway, it was the, uh, it was the car ride from Louisville to Evansville. On March 27, 1946, where Luth, uh, Buddy Rogers insulted Strangler Lewis in front of Luthez and started that beef that lasted most of the rest of their lives. And again, like I said, in, in the 1940s, late 40s, after the war, before television, they're drawing crowds of 6,000 people like Primo Carnera versus Jules Strongbow, Luthez and Bobby Bruns. Longson drew against Thez was a big match, drew 7,300 people. Blah, blah, blah. So anyway, throughout the 50s, which was the hottest period because television came in, Gardens, the Gardens was almost weekly. Uh, Leone and Thez got a rematch from the Los Angeles Gilmore Field event in uh, on the 52 Derby Eve show. And they drew a, a rematch in 55, drew 9,500 people which, according to the local newspaper, included 1,200 underprivileged kids and orphans. Hey, I which, should, I should probably ahead. know this, and I don't, but I know about that match, because you've talked about it in the past, but did Fez and Leone actually go to various cities to rematch the L.A. match? Yes, for a couple of years. I mean, Well, they, they wrestled each other in a variety of cities off the notoriety of that match. That's what I mean. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and it was still in, in 55, you know, that was three years later. And that's, that's uh, from what we can tell, the biggest wrestling crowd in the history of the, the, the Armory slash Convention Center slash Louisville Gardens, because if they let the kids in, uh, like I said, before the renovations in the early 60s, it could seat, we've seen basketball uh, game sellouts, and, you know, you can kind of envision you know, eight to 9,000 people in there, but it would had to have utilized every goddamn seat and standing space possible in that building. And that had to be the craziest wrestling crowd you've ever seen. Cause I can't imagine any tighter fit in any building set up like that for a wrestling show. But anyway, then, and we've talked about it when the local promoter that had taken over for Haywood Allen died in 1957, then we came under the auspices of the Indianapolis office and Barnett and then Bruiser, and it was an afterthought, and Bruiser just cut it off entirely. And so the town was dark, or the building was dark from 65 to 70. But other than that, on and off in the teens and 20s, often in the 30s and 40s and very regularly weekly in the 50s, there were big time shows with names of the era, whoever they may be, in that building. And then the early 60s, they were there, just, you know, the crowds didn't come. They took five years off, and then Jarrett opened it up in 1970 and ran every week for 27 more years. And then Danny Davis picked up an OVW, and we ran for. You know, three years there until they closed the fucking building. Jerry Jarrett never tried to do anything to tie into the Derby? Uh, no, because, no. We're staying because, on Tuesday no matter what? Here's the thing. The Derby Eve shows back then worked before television. Then even after TV, you know, when it was still kind of an institution and... It was just a different time. There was no der there. I don't even think there was a Kentucky Derby festival back then. But in modern times, we came, I mean, starting when I was a kid, there became the, the Pegasus Parade and the Great Steamboat Race 
and the great balloon race. And then Thunder over Louisville became a thing, I don't know how many years ago, 20-some years or whatever. There is some major event almost every day in Louisville <laughs> for the two weeks before starting with Thunder over Louisville and culminating with the, well, and, and the fucking, you know, day before the uh, Derby is a big fucking race at Churchill Downs now. So there's, it wouldn't work in the modern times. The Kentucky Derby Festival Commission has taken over the whole thing. You don't, unless you're selling a show to some part of the Kentucky Derby Festival for down at the riverfront, free admission or whatever. No, we, you, it's long since gone to where you don't run really any major entertainment attraction that's not tied into the Derby Festival anywhere around Derby time. And that includes the concerts at the uh, at the fairgrounds and everything else that's part of the Derby Festival now. There ain't no room. Does that answer your question? That answered my question. All right. Well, don't don't, don't dare bring something like that up again. Hey, and before let's say nineteen sixty two, what are the biggest touring matches? When we're talking about Thez and Leone, what other matches gained such great notoriety that the match itself could go on tour? Oh, God. Outside of the home territory of wherever it took place with the big Well, star. but now, but now I would think that Fez and Ganya off the early 50s television would have been attractive anywhere. But it didn't happen that often. It did happen a few times. It didn't happen often. Um, Good Lord. Fez and Rogers happened in the 50s, but was it, I mean, that's kind of, a, it's not as big as Leone and Fez in the 50s obviously no and and it wasn't it, it was a big match between two big stars but nobody at the time knew just you know exactly what was the undercurrents of their personal feelings and etc were but it it's almost like thez was starting to become the elder statesman and rogers was still on the way up there and that's you know when thez dropped the title to leave the country, do the international tour. Rogers was still getting bigger. Rogers' best years were 60 at the gate were 61 and 62. And Thez was semi-retired and picking his spots at that point until they asked him to come back and take it. So what about Kowalski and Yukon Eric? That was probably attractive, but I would think only in the Canada, the Northeastern United States, were either one of them ever linked or tied up out west? Fez and Leone made a lot of news, and and because yeah. of the the national TV and the power of the Los Angeles TV at that time, Ganya was on the Chicago television, so he was a di but he was a serious wrestler. Gorgeous George was on the LA TV. He drew houses to see him, but it, there wasn't necessarily a a touring opponent that was a big money match. It was just, we're going to see gorgeous George. So I don't know. Most of the big world title matches, if they had a rematch. How do you think you would have handled gorgeous George as a booker, knowing that you can get people because of the time and place into the door to see him at least once. What do you do about keeping them? Uh, you know, gosh, Back at that, in that period of time, it was completely different, you know, different perception in the part of people as to wrestling and whatever, and whether booking was good or bad. You never, I wouldn't think, they wanted to sacrifice. Gorgeous George was a heel in terms of his gimmick and in terms of what he did, but you wouldn't want to sacrifice your top baby face in your big city to him or whatever, I would think at that point, I would have bo always booked Gorgeous George against an upper level baby face that wasn't figured into my title plans or any world title plans, or I didn't want to fucking carry my territory on his back because I would think that especially the first time around in the television glory era, he had to, George had to go over so you wouldn't want to beat your fucking top star in your town with this guy who was a good wrestler, but the gimmick overshadowed it. So I would have, I would think 
But then again, especially in the early days of television, things weren't programmed as tightly as they were in the territory days with this guy being involved with a program with this guy and a rivalry with this guy. And it was just more the names being matched up like still boxing. So you could afford to say, Gorgeous George will be here and he'll take on, he won't be against Bruno, he'll be against Chief J Strongbow. Does that make any sense? He can beat Strongbow, we don't give a shit. It makes sense. It's an interesting thing to think about what life would be like if you can go back to like the early days of television and apply angles to so many things. Because it wasn't like there were angles right away on TV. At least, I mean, other than the matches themselves and the results being yeah. angles leading to things. Well, that's a, a, an angle by definition. Originally in the early days of television, the angle was, my God, he pulled his tights when he pinned him. And that would get people up on the... Uh, apron of the ring and throwing shit and beating on the mat because that was that was cheating and they're just seeing it so unless you've been going to live wrestling matches they were just seeing it on television it's, holy shit he cheated if they just started doing modern wrestling angles which is has been proven by what we've done to the business if they just started out doing modern wrestling angles and nobody <laughs> selling anything and everybody just whacking each other with blunt instruments we'd have been out of business in 74 with roller derby because they would have seen everything and we'd have burned all through it. Just like the last 20 years, they've seen everything. We burned all through it. Speaking of which, this is a good segue. I'll have, you know, to a question that I, it was a long email that I got. I've been looking through the emails again. That's dangerous. And this, and I, I won't berate the, uh, the fellow, because it sounded like he's a more recent fan that has read on the internet how wrestling is done and has some mis misrepre misapprehensions or misimpressions or whatever. And it was kind of a long email, but basically the question was, why do we, you and I, Brian, why do we criticize matches when we criticize the matches not for the wrestlers work, I guess, actually execution of the moves or whatever, the wrestlers work, but for the logic or continuity, or the, we say this match didn't make sense, or why would you do the, this and that? And the guy basically said, isn't that the way the booker would have booked it? So how could it be the wrestler's fault? And I'm, I'm not going to say that there's no place now in the world of wrestling or in some independent promotion or, you know, the guys that run their hometown on their birthday where they don't, when they write down, I want Ben to wrestle Joe, they don't actually write the match that they want them to have out and, and pitch it to them. Or maybe Ben's the booker too and the promoter and, and he and Joe... I, you know, maybe that might happen, but for the most part, and I don't know what they're doing over with the booking. I bet Tony Khan, the way he does a media scrum or a media call, he might very well sit down and write out wrestling matches, move for move. He might have the time and energy for that. I don't understand. I, how. Don't, I don't think he's gone that far. I, who knows? Well, maybe he just doesn't show them to anybody yet. <clears throat> He's waiting to see whether the other guys can do it right. But anyway, the, the way that a booker or the interaction that a booker would have in the actual match with the wrestlers, I will try to as clearly and succinctly as possible explain what it would have been like in the wrestling business, basically from the time that they invented doing finishes to I don't know what, 15 or 20 years ago when the, the world went mad, as our friend Einar said. And that is basically that the booker is the person who not only, as we've mentioned before, hires the wrestling talent. He's in charge of the roster. If you're the booker of Florida wrestling or Georgia wrestling or New Jersey wrestling, then you've brought the wrestlers in that you want to use on the cards. That's your decision. And you also decide 
on the live events, which one of those wrestlers wrestle each other? You make the matches. It's Joe versus Tom and Dick versus Harry and whatever the case. And as the booker, you also decide who's going to win those matches and how in, in terms of pinfall, disqualification, count out, whatever. And also, as the booker, especially a good one, and now, now is where we're going to start getting into variables. Almost every booker in the history of bookers would do all the things that I just talked about and format the television show, same as live events. Here's who's going to wrestle who, and here's who's going to talk. The booker anywhere would do all of those things. Then bookers would, depending on the talent involved and or the match, would then give you, most of the time, a specific finish. Sometimes, if the booker is talking to one of the biggest stars in wrestling, and it's a TV match or whatever, he'll just say, okay, you're going over whatever. We'll talk about that in a second. But if let's say we're talking about House show matches here, that used to be the most important thing, not television. So the house show matches, the booker, if he was also a wrestler on the card, might not be able to come in to the other side's locker room. If he was a heel, he wouldn't be able to come in a babyface locker room or vice versa, not just because of kayfabe, but sometimes because of the layout of the building. Can't get there from here without going through the people and them seeing you. So. That's where the finish would be carried by one of the referees or an assistant booker or somebody that could pass around easily. And basically, as I said, past telling you who was going to win, if he was going to give you a specific finish, he would give you literally the finish. And it would sound something like, okay, if it's the Rock and Roll Express versus the Midnight Express, he'd be telling the Midnight Express, okay, Shine them up, and then cut Riggy off and get some heat. Now you've just cut the first 10 minutes of the match down. Do shine him up, <laughs> or shine him up, and cut Riggy off and get some heat. It's implied that the wrestlers are going to go out, and the heels are going to shine the baby faces. They're going to make them look good. They're going to put them over. They're going to make them look like they've, they're world beaters. And then Ricky Morton is the one we're going to cut off with a heel fucking cutoff move, something behind the referee's back or double team or insidious or not exactly according to Hoyle, and we're going to get some heat on Ricky. So, shine him up, cut Ricky off, get some heat on him, give Hoot the tag, that means after the heat, which is going to take another five or ten minutes, that's up to the boys. They're going to kick the shit out of Ricky. He's going to sell and fight back and try to tag. And he's going to get the people behind him in that endeavor. And there's going to be a couple times where he almost makes it, but not quite. So they're almost ready to fucking blow. And that's where, and give hoot the hot tag comes in. Ricky's going to make the hot tag out of nowhere to Robert Gibson. Come back. Finally, hit a false finish. That means Robert's going to make a comeback, and the heels are going to bump for him as long as the people are screaming. Probably he's going to take, each heel will take three bumps from a punch, then Hoot will, in his younger days, drop kick, drop kick, shoot one off, fucking sleeper or cross body. That's a false finish. That brings the fucking other heel back for the save, four-way. And it boom, boom, boom. Dump Ricky to the floor because he's the illegal guy. Stop Hoot from behind. Go for a fucking double vertical suplex on him. And that's where the booker would have said, during the heat, hit Ricky with a double vertical suplex. That way in the finish, they'll understand what you're going for. You go to double vertical suplex Robert. Ricky comes in from outside the ring and body blocks one of the Midnight Express out from under the double suplex. That causes the fucking imbalance of the goddamn weight. Gibson's feet go back down to the mat. He rolls the other heel up in the fucking jackknife one, two, three, and the baby faces slide to the floor. So the whole, giving you the whole finish for the whole fucking 20-minute match, the booker said, 
shine them up, cut Riggy off, get some heat, give Hoot the hot tag, come back, false finish, four-way, fucking dump Ricky to the floor, go for the double vertical suplex, he'll come back in, block Stan out, Hoot fucking small packages, Bobby, one, two, three, faces slide out, leave the ring, the heels to bitch. The rest of the 20 minutes was up to the fucking wrestlers. And I'm again, I've I've seen Dusty Rhodes give Ric Flair a goddamn finish for him and whoever the for a 45 minute match that took 30 seconds to impart. Because you're the booker is not the writer of the match. The booker is the football coach and he's calling the play. And he's letting his talent, as Dutch Mantel always said, run the fucking play. So if the match doesn't make sense, or if it doesn't accomplish the point of what you're trying to do, it's the wrestler's fault because they didn't fucking put together the match right. And here's another thing. There's degrees of matches, which we've talked about guys not knowing how to work with people of different standings. It's like modern guys, no matter if they're a main event guy, no matter who they're working with, they want to have the best match possible even if it doesn't make a lick of fucking visual or mental sense for this top main event star to be taken to the limit for 20 minutes by this guy that never wins a match, we looks like shit, we've never heard of him. Just because he can. So there were different degrees of matches that a booker would, let's say, you're in the territory days and in all days until <clears throat> recently, the heel called the match. Because most of the time, nobody had spoken to each other before they got in the ring, or if they did, it was minimal, and you never planned a match out ahead of time. You called it in front of the people as it happened, which is why it looked a little rough around the edges, but more spontaneous and somewhat more credible. But the heel would call the match, except, again, if there was a giant mismatch. If Dusty Rhodes was in the ring against fucking Black Bart, Dusty was calling the match, right? But if, if if the baby face star of the territory, Jerry Lawler, he always called his matches, even when he was a baby face. But again, who could do it better? Nobody. He was one of the best. But the heel generally, or heels in a tag team match, would call the match. So it was most important for the booker to get across to the heels what the fucking match was supposed to be, what was supposed to be accomplished out of it, what the point was that you're supposed to end up, who's supposed to go over, what are the, what thought are the fans supposed to be left with, did we get an object over, did we get a title over, personal issue, further some guy, whatever the fuck. So there were degrees, and and again, all the booker had to do was communicate the tone of what he wanted, and a good heel would then produce that match. If I'm the booker and I've got a top heel and he's going to have a match against a baby face that we're just making up out of thin air, if I tell that heel, beat the fuck out of him and beat him, and that's it's a job match, a squash match as the kids call it these days. <laughs> he's in there with a job guy and it's to showcase my heel and him to do all his stuff that makes him look like a badass, beat the fuck out of this guy and beat him. Or if I tell the heel, have a match and beat him, then that means that I don't want him to just treat the guy like a piece of shit. I want him to have a match with him and then beat him. And maybe I'm, it's, that's, you know, the first time squash match is four minutes. Maybe this is six minutes. And that's another thing the heel can, uh, the booker will tell is the time. And the heel will know, okay, in four minutes, it's, he's a squash match. In six minutes, I got time to give the kid a couple spots. I'll miss something, let him fucking have some offense, cut him off, give him a little bit of a comeback, and I'll beat him with my finish. If I tell the heel, have a good match, and then beat him, that means I want him to have a good match. Because <laughs> not all matches are supposed to be good. Have a good match and beat him means, well, you're going to get an extra minute or two, and let's let's get up and down. Let's let the kid show what he can do, and then you're still going to beat him. So that means it's going to be kind of competitive. If I tell the heel, 
have a real good match and fuck him, then that means that I want this heel to make this baby face look competitive, have an exciting match with him, and then because he's tried a time or two to beat him and it didn't work, he's going to have to cheat. He's going to have to fuck him. And then he's going to beat him. But he had to cheat because the baby face was that good. Or then if I say, have a great match with this kid and slip him over, then that means we're elevating this guy and I want you to have a great competitive match with him and give the people plenty of doubt who's going to win and make the kid look real good and then slip him over, as, as they used to say, and Vince McMahon hates that phrase, but it's widely used, which means that out of nowhere, some way, the babyface capitalizes on a heel mistake. He's in the right place at the right time. He's resourceful, and he fucking gets a win and slides out of that ring before the heel can get up and turn around and go, what the fuck, I'll kill you. That's slipping him over, but he won. And the people should be ready for that. And if the heel's giving him a good match, they will be. And on one of those, that's where you don't even give the heel a time. You just say, get it right, which used to be Dusty's favorite thing. He'd have a time for all the underneath matches. And he knew his last two, he just, get it right, which means you guys go out and have this fucking match and get them where you want them to be and then take it home. It's up to you because I trust you. And then there's one more degree that I could tell that heel. We are bringing in, God damn, this kid, this baby face, we want to make this kid. So have a great match and put him over flat in the fucking middle. And that's the last final fucking thing you can do where this heel is going to have the best match he can have with this guy. And he's going to put over all the guy's shit and he's going to fucking get some heat on him so the kid can sell. And then he's going to give the kid a big comeback. And in some way or another, that baby face coming out of nowhere is going to beat that top heel flat in the middle with his fucking finish one, two, three. And if you had a goddamn competent heel and you had chosen his opponent fairly wisely, that's all you had to say to guys. And you got that match of four minutes or eight minutes or 15 minutes or 20 minutes or whatever the fuck it was. And yes, especially detail-oriented individuals like Bill Watts or Eddie Graham would give more complicated finishes especially in big angles or in important matches. And, I mean, that's the joke has been that, you know, Eddie Graham would spend five minutes telling you the finish, and part of it would be three drop kicks, and he'd watch the match, and if he only did two, but everything else was perfect, you came back, he'd say, where was the third drop kick? And Watts was the same way, but that was at the upper echelon of things, on the big shows or the personal... Uh, the the things that they were shepherding and overseeing and producing personally that the territory hung on. But uh, the idea that the booker tells the wrestlers what foot to put in front of another, I didn't know was that prevalent that people thought that these days, young Brian. Was that the question again? I mean, you went over a lot of different things, and at the end here, I was trying to remember what the question was. It yes, how yes. could people how could people be upset at wrestlers for a bad match? It's the Booker's fault. Was that well, it? Well, for, not for a bad match, not for their work being bad. Like if they botched the moves, but if the match didn't make sense, if the match was because we talk about this makes no sense, they're doing shit that makes no sense in the match. I get if if the table doesn't break, it's the wrestler's fault. But if the guy puts the fucking wrestler through a table two minutes into the match and then they go another twenty, that's the booker's fault. Of course, because they think that the booker controls everything you see, like the control voice on the outer limits, one foot in front of the other. And that's I it, like I said, maybe sometimes they do that these days. But no, now the wrestlers. The wrestlers have always been the ones that control what happens in the ring. It's just that they used to call it as it was happening and it made sense. And now they dwell on it for days and weeks before the match happens. And the whole thing goes to hell logically in five minutes. 
But that is the wrestler's fault, not the booker. <sighs> Questions? Like I said, you covered a lot of ground there. When it comes to the idea of the planning out of matches or the booking out of an actual individual match in the back, that isn't a job for the booker. Traditionally, you know, almost romantically, wrestlers called it in the ring. But we always hear the stories about Randy Savage approaching Ricky Steamboat with a list of moves, and this is exactly how the match will go. Dallas Page learned that from Randy Savage. I believe the story is he tried to do that with The Undertaker, and The Undertaker <laughs> did not act react well. Now there's a different way of doing it, obviously, where there's a lot of sequences and a lot of pre-planned stuff. What, from your history of being in the back, when did you start seeing things in terms of move-for-move move planning in the back? Um, in the WWF, in the, in the late 90s, because I, I was in... Smoky Mountain for most of the time from 92 through 95. And I mean, planning out at television is a little bit diff became a little bit of a different animal in the late eighties because suddenly there, there came to be more, if not main event than at least competitive matches, top matches, matches amongst, you know, more used talent rather than just squash matches all the time. But the time constraint of the one hour show or the, you know, whatever was still there. And so you wanted to make sure that you had the opportunity to have as good a match as possible and use up the TV time that you were given. So that's where guys started. And you, it was easier to get together at TV tapings. You were there earlier. You're there before the people got in the building. So that's when it started being, okay, well, I mean, you still may have been doing spots you were doing in live events, but you were tightening it up in between. You would, you would, instead of calling it as it happened, just based on what the people were buying that night, like a house show, you would say, well, let's do the fucking rowboat spot and the fucking drape spot and the this spot and that spot. Boom. And then we'll cut you off and get the heat and the blah, blah, blah. So there was more of the match set up ahead of time to, in terms of the high spots. And the, 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 the bullet points, it was still a bullet point type of thing, but just to utilize the TV time as best as possible. And then by the time, you know, mid nineties, WWF, I'm watching guys go to the ring and, you know, before the actual fans were let in, but they're still building people out there and everything. And they're ducking clotheslines in the ring and working on shit. And I'm like, huh, this is new. And then it became more, you know, uh, prevalent. And that's when in, in OVW, we tried as much as possible to not let guys do that uh, in terms of planning the match out 100%. I would give them the framework because, again, you know, the, the, the house shows were for practice where I, ju I would just say, go out and have a good match, 12 minutes, slip him over. Because I, you know, I would want to see how they're doing on their own. But on television, I still wouldn't tell them what to do foot by foot. I would say, okay, you got eight minutes. So if you go out and give me three nice spots where you shine the baby face and then do this heat spot. And I'd su suggest a heat spot for them. And I say, get two minutes of heat. I'm giving them a framework, but I'm not telling them everything to do. And then I say, you know, I would know the moves that they did or the things that they, you know, were good at or whatever, or that they had gotten over with the people they recognized. So I'd say, go for your whatever the fuck, your flying dingbat, but he can move so you can sell and fire up and come back. And then let's hit two false finishes. And, you know, as soon as that happens, boom, the referee's going to call it and here comes the run in and blah, blah, blah. I'd give them the framework, but they would still need to fill in the blanks. It wasn't paint by numbers. It was, here's the subject of your painting and a couple of other things I'd like to see in it and try to use these four colors. Okay, go. Anyway. You know where I'd like to go, Brian, right now? I can think of a few places. Where's that? Omaha. Because that's where I'm going tonight. As soon as we get off this uh, fine podcast right now, I'm going to Omaha. 
courtesy of our fine friends at Omaha Steaks, because I just got the box that I've been talking to everybody about that they should be getting for the holiday season to feed the friends, to feed the family, or just to feed your own needs. And tonight I've got two of the sirloins and two of the filet mignons sitting down there marinating and I'm salivating. And Stacy gets to pick any one that she wants, and then I get the other three. And we've also got some of the sides with the scalloped potatoes and the caramel apple tartlets, because they've got not only the meat, but also the sides and everything to go with it. But the big news is this ridiculous sale that's going on. Folks, if you go to omahasteaks.com right now, the cows are terrified. Because they are, their gooses are about to be cooked because meat is 50% off site wide at omahasteaks.com. 50% off site wide on these special curated gift packages to help take the guesswork out of gifting and make you a holiday hero or a grilling guru. The butcher's cut filet mignons, the air chilled boneless chicken, the juicy burgers. As I mentioned, they, they got those sirloins that are incredible. The, the wieners, the giant hot dogs, they're made, all the meat from Omaha. I don't know. They must, they must really pamper all those pigs and cows out there. But they're ready to ship it right now, and you can still get it in time for the holidays if you go to omahasteaks.com. 50% off site-wide sale, as I mentioned. A minimum order may be required on that. Why in the world would you not order the maximum if meat is 50% off? But if you use the promo code JCE at checkout, you get an extra $30 off your order. And I'm trying to get my head wrapped around how that they can do this. 50% off, then an extra $30 off. They're losing money every time they knock poor bossy on his head and send him to you. So. Regardless of how you like your meat, whether it's rare, medium, well done, or knock the horns off and bring it out on a leash, gifts like perfectly aged, tender, juicy steaks and burgers and decadent desserts and classic comfort meals and all that stuff will definitely get people's interest peaked and their saliva salivating. OmahaSteaks.com, promo code JCE at checkout. For $30 off the order that might already, depending on what you get, be 50% off. This sounds like Steiner math to me. How are they making out on this? I think they're making out all right. Well, the, the cow must suffer. I'll tell you that. It's cheaper than ever to get a cow on your plate these days with OmahaSteaks.com. Well, but I guess I'm glad I don't have a full stomach right now because we're going to talk briefly about the AEW program from this past Wednesday night, which apparently made news for technical difficulties on Spectrum Cable's end. This is what I heard was that a bunch of people had a freeze frame from the Big Bang Theory and that there were other issues with people who are foolishly like I am patrons of Spectrum Cable. Mine worked! For the first hour and a half of the program, that's where I heard all the problems were. What, what do you hear about this? Well, you kind of said exactly what I heard, and I saw some screenshots on Twitter. People said that they had Spectrum, and I immediately think of you because you've made them famous. And then they showed the screenshot of the Big Bang Theory. So you had a problem at a different time? Yes, because I was all ready to go back to the, to the DVR going, ah, oh, this ain't going to work. And unfortunately, it worked perfectly. For the first hour and a half of the program, everything was fine, and then suddenly the goddamn audio just dropped out. And for the last half hour, there was perfect picture and no audio. But I, unfortunately, I know what happened there, and I had to watch most of the rest of it. Um, it I don't know if, if uh, friendly journalists were trying to set them up for a rotten rating based on the quality of the program or whether that problem really was widespread but i don't i don't know how i had something other people didn't have and vice versa we'll we'll see what happens but the program started with now this year 
the Dynamite Diamond Battle Royal was not for the Dynamite Diamond. It was for which MJF has won three years in a row. He It was for the winner of this match to get a shot at the Dynamite Diamond, right? But Starks was already going to wrestle MJF. What don't I get about this? Yeah, you're right. What did Starks win? He did win something where he had a title shot already, right? Yes. He won the tournament or whatever they had. Now he's won the Dynamite Diamond Battle Royal, but he don't get the Dynamite Diamond. He gets a shot at the Diamond. No, but but he already saying- had a shot at the guy that has the Diamond. Who's hmm. got the pearl? I, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> well, anyway, we come on the air from the Big Bang Theory. Some people still had the Big Bang Theory. And it's a battle royal, and here comes Ricky Starks and Jungle Boy and Dustin Rhodes. And then everybody else was already at ringside, and apparently it was all job guys and underneath guys. I saw Dalton Castle and the Blade and whatever, and they just jumped in and started fighting without any introductions. And Sockface rattled off about half a dozen names, and it, and it was a battle royal. And who gives a shit, right? So I'm just trying to get through this thing. And did you see the spot with Brian Cage and Jungle Boy? Yeah, I did see it. And I was hoping you had seen it too. Uh, I watched it back <laughs> four or five times. So Brian Cage is all big and bad, his jacked up self, picks up poor old Dalton Castle and throws him over the top rope so his boys can catch him and stands there and hits a double bicep, which is his best move in wrestling. And Jungle Boy drop kicks him in the back. And then he apparently realized that he was supposed to go over the top rope, but he was only like two feet from it. So he just lurched into the rope and got hung and then stopped and then threw his right leg up in the air on purpose and kind of rolled over the top rope on purpose so that they could do some contrived back and forth on the apron before he got knocked to the ground and was eliminated. So anyway, apparently now the story of the last of this thing is Matt Hardy and the other page were in it, and Hardy has lost a match of some description. I think they got it off the Seinfeld episode. He has to be the other page's butler. Because now Paige is telling him what's for, and he's going, delete, delete, I don't want to do this, and they argue with each other. And... Somehow, Captain Sean Dean, is that is he a captain or a colonel? Is it Colonel Sean Dean? No, it's captain. He's a captain. captain. I wasn't sure whether he'd been promoted or not. But Captain Sean Dean, who we haven't seen in a, how the fuck long, I don't know, suddenly ended up at the top, the bottom four in this, Dean Starks, the other page, and Matt Hardy. And while they were arguing with each other, they pitched, Dean out eventually and then argued some more and then Starks dumped Matt and the other page picked up Starks and threw him over but Starks held on and Page lost it it, it is a nice looking bump but I'm not sure it made sense logically and physically but some way or another he threw the guy over but Ricky held on and Page went over and Starks won But then MJF's music hit, and I was like, okay, let's stick with this thing for a minute. And then we got to the point where, and Brian, I think you mentioned this the other day, it's almost like you get into something on this show where you think, this is a good show. And then suddenly everything goes to shit. And MJF and Starks face-to-face was great. And Starks was held his own with him. Uh, MJF had blistered Danielson for not showing up tonight, quote unquote. Uh, he wasn't there. I, the whole thing with Regal, blah, blah, blah. But when MJF is cutting the promo, here's one thing I was thinking, though. MJF is cutting the promo and the fans are chanting, shut the fuck up. And then MJF tells Ricky Starks, you're the drizzling shits, which. You know, I guess it isn't as bad as shut the fuck up, but, you know, there's a new head of programming. Did you see this? 
I did. It's a separate question we should probably talk about. Yes, but I'm just saying there's a new head of programming. And I just, the farther they get removed from the people who gave them this deal, as more and more people turn over, I just can't imagine that somebody eventually in TBS and TNT is going to want to hear fuck 18 times on their basic cable in prime time. <clears throat> anyway, so MJF said that Starks was a dollar store Dwayne, started calling him the pebble and said he was going to run him back to Billy Corgan's NWA so he could wrestle on YouTube where he belongs. And I just noted Starks needs a good comeback here. And fuck, he got it. As soon as he got the microphone and said, well, maxi pad. And the fans started chanting maxi pad. And he, Starks tore up fucking MJF's tan and his clothes and his style and what, and the people were with it. And he said, cheap suit, cheap shoes, cheap heat. You fifth rate Roddy Piper wannabe. And he stood up for himself. And you could tell, again, this wasn't something that had been written. I, after I saw this, I saw a couple of pieces of SmackDown. And it was so phony and so stagey and so contrived and written next to these two guys. So, after that big promo, MJF kicked Starks in the balls, which was perfect. But he turned take off his belt and his watch and shit, and he put the ring on, he swung with the ring, and Starks ducked it and hit him with a big spear, and they fucking, the place came unglued. So that, that 10 minutes or whatever it was, was the best piece of wrestling television all week. On this program, which is, already you're at a disadvantage being on this program, but I mean, you know, Starks, he can talk, he looks good, he seems serious. We've seen him, you know, work fantastic. And then there was the match with Hobbs, and we were like, what the fuck? But he has had a, he had a broken neck earlier, didn't he? A year ago or however long, they dropped him on his head. I hope that he's physically okay. I have a feeling this will be a great fucking match between the two of them, if he, if everybody is at a hundred percent. It shouldn't be just a match. It should be a feud. It should be weeks of these guys doing promos. Ricky Starks has been used so poorly for so long, even though he's had incredible talent and the fans got behind him on their own, despite the bad booking. He needed something to not be thought of as that guy. And what he needed was a fiery promo that felt real and we got it. And it was him and MJF going back and forth. And we'll see how this plays out. I certainly hope it's more than one match with AEW. You never know. And that's the one thing <laughs> you worry about. Cause you're like, Oh wow, this has the makings of something that long-term due to their age. And you know, just, it could be yeah. a long-term thing that produces great TV because of their talent. You hope it's just not just like one match and then, all right, now you're going to work with Jericho or whatever the fuck it'll be. But this, well, they've, Go. The, the the place they're pointing to, obviously, is MJF and Danielson, now that MJF has turned on the man that Brian Danielson loves, according to the promo he did last week or whenever. And for a marquee pay-per-view world title match, MJF and Danielson right now has more appeal. But at the same time, when's the next time they've got a pay-per-view? They don't have one for a while, right? Hopefully. I don't think so. They usually have one in what, February or something? Except there's a Ring of Honor thing that we'll talk about in a minute. Um, AEW in your house. Yeah, they're going to come to everybody's house individually and do it. But one would think that maybe it, it would help Danielson with the way that he's been presented. Could now MJF do something heinous? to Danielson, it gets him off TV for six weeks and out of and away from the Blackpool Combat Club and on a singular mission of his own to get even for his mentor and friend, William Regal, when he comes back from injury that gives Starks a little time and a little breathing room to carry the torch. Well, I'll get even for goddamn Brian Danielson and friend for all the other people that you've jacked around, 
you prick, and they could have some room to run with that. And then if Danielson came back away from Moxley and useless and the rest of that, the whole misguided thing, maybe he could recapture a little bit of his oomph as a single guy with a spotlight on him that he had before until they put him in his group and neutered him. Hey, watching this segment, and again, watching it from the inception of when MJF came out, seeing last week, to the people who said MJF can't be booed, he can't be a heel, the fans love him too much, <laughs> they're booing the shit out of him. Yes, they are. Because he showed his true colors. They wanted to like the wise-ass when he was saying wise-ass things about people that they didn't like. But then, when he started saying it about their mothers, the wise ass wasn't as entertaining. Did you see his tweet earlier today? I did not. I guess he's going to Vegas for, I think it's UFC. Put out a tweet. Made a list before my flight to Vegas. People started sending this to the drive through email. People that will never beat me for the triple B. The Pebble. The American Dipshit Dragon. <laughs> War Ho. <laughs> Edward. Sensitive Cowboy. <laughs> Jungle Jabroni, <laughs> Darbs the school shooter, Ooh. Adam, my brain don't work, so I can't cope Cole, oh. and, <laughs> and Mr. Clean, in quotes, Castagnoli. That's what I like about the man. He loves to make friends. Hey, yeah, uh, speak, go ahead. If I can ask you a question to go back to the uh, Battle Royal, Dustin Rhodes got a big pop. Looks good. I mean, always looks good. It's not a surprise that Dustin Rhodes, everything he does in the ring looks great, and it looks better and better every time you see him. It never gets worse. He's announced publicly that he'll be retiring next year. Is there something there? Despite the way he's been used for 20 years, or whatever you want to argue, but we saw what happened when they built up the Cody thing. That was effective. The Cody match, I should say. Yeah. Dustin Rhodes, one last time, want to get his hands on MJF. Give it a real build. Don't rush it. Don't throw it away. Don't make it the main event on Rampage or Battle of the Belts. Is there something there? Can they talk people into really wanting to see Dustin get his chance against MJF for yes. the belt? Yes, I believe they could. I believe as, as emotional as Dustin, because he really is going to retire, and he's in his mid-50s even though he looks so good. So he could get emotional enough about this being his, his last big chance. Or maybe he even downplays expectations that he would win the title, but he wants to teach the fucking kid a lesson before he goes. It, a personal issue in that point, because a lot of these fans be smart enough, they might even say, well, they're not going to put the belt on him. Maybe he doesn't even care about, th about that. Maybe something happens that shames the Rhodes, Dustin himself or the Rhodes family or hurts his feelings in some respect that he wants to one time before he's done teach that fucking kid a lesson. Hey, you know what? I mean, they like to play with this stuff on TV, so it's not completely crazy. They make a lot of references to WWE on TV, so it's not crazy. If it wasn't for you, my brother would be here right now and he'd be the world champion. Boom. There you go. You turned on my brother in that match with Jericho with a stipulation where you never get a world title shot again. He's not even here anymore. And it's all because of you. You turned on my brother, you dirty rat. <laughs> it's all, yeah. It's, <laughs> but, it, but it would have to be instigated by something that MJF did, maybe to some kid that, that Dustin had taken under his wing, one of his students, and MJF just sodomizes him with a rusty fishing knife or whatever, and Dustin comes out and... and Metaphorically then speaking. Well, yeah, if, if necessary. And then MJF berates Dustin as a broken-down has-been, a sway-backed horse that ought to be taken out behind the barn and shot. Well, you think this horse has, doesn't have one more ride left in him? And a blah, 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 and there you, it would be more interesting than this fucking best of seven trampoline championship <laughs> where they're all fucking mute. Not one of them ever goddamn speaks. You can't stand to hear the fucking Buckaroos' voice. You can't understand 
most of the other team and fucking twinkle toes just oh. does the phone sex thing and oh. sighs a lot. Oh. <laughs> All right, let's get back to this program. Now that we've given them another main event that they won't take advantage of. Uh, Samoa Joe wrestled Darby Allen. And once again, I love Samoa Joe. I don't know how they have managed to do this to where, you know, I've, I've complained in the past that they bring guys in and don't, you know, give them any wins on television. So he's figured out a way to make the guy less over and less interesting by giving him wins on television, just to get even with me. Samoa Joe and Darby Allen could have been a good match, I would think, but apparently not for either the way it was booked or not for this audience, they can't sit and watch a wrestling match, apparently, or can't be trusted to ahead of time. Or maybe Darby Allen just refuses to not do this shit. As Samoa Joe's got two belts now, the Ring of Honor TV title and the TNT title. So he's, he's champion of a network that they're barely on now and champion of a company that barely exists. But are they, okay, they'll have a good match. 30 seconds in, Darby Allen dives through the ropes head first and just completely misses Joe. And on purpose, it was a miss spot. And cannonballs himself all the way to the railing. That was 30 seconds in the match. Wasn't the finish. Wasn't even hardly the start. Joe pulls the pad up off the concrete while the referee's standing there and doing nothing about it and never tried to put it back. And then Joe gave Darby Allen a turnaround spinning power slam on the concrete floor. That's the break spot. A 300-pound Samoan power slammed this 150-pound emaciated skateboarder on a concrete floor for a break spot. When they come back three minutes later, Joe runs him down the apron of the ring and into the ring post, and he spins around in two flips and takes a bump off the apron of the floor again. That's not the finish. The doctor checks on him while the referee took about a full minute for a 10 count, but he beat the count. And then Darby Allen was back in the ring. Joe gets a two count. After he's power slammed him on the concrete, he's missed a dive and cannonballed the rail. He's been run head first into the fucking ring post and bounced off 15 feet. And then, within 30 seconds, Darby Allen is up, leaping over the top rope, giving Joe a coffin drop off the top rope to the floor, and then running and leaping and making a comeback and getting two counts. This is what we talk about when I say you can give somebody a finish, but the match is up to them, and this was horrible. Because what can anybody else do? And how ineffective can Samoa Joe be? What else can you do to hurt a motherfucker? If this fucking emaciated small child cannot be hurt by any of this, why should anybody sell anything? And if Samoa Joe, at twice his body weight and twice his experience level, at twice everything, does all this shit, and guess what the finish was? After all that, Joe caught him coming off the top in another coffin drop and choked him out. So, power slam on a concrete didn't beat him. Head first into the ring post like a fucking lawn dart didn't beat him. Diving head first to concrete floor didn't beat him. We choked him out. But it's okay... Because then after the finish, Joe's parading around and Darby Allen got back up and dared him to fight him again. <laughs> so he did. Because there's an afterbirth in every match. And Joe beats him up again and then gives him a muscle buster on the skateboard with the wheel side sticking up. And then put the choke on him and choked him out again. Now Darby Allen's a fucking complete just piece of shit. He got beat. Got up, got smart, got beat again. Meanwhile, he's the strongest man in the fucking company, but he's still a piece of shit. Everybody suffered here. And then Wardlow came out and hit the ring, and Joe bailed out with no contact. And so that was anticlimactic. So 
we can kind of stop wrestling now because a 300 pound Samoan giant can't hurt a fucking skateboarder half his size with anything he does. What do you think of this contest? It was nice to see Darby in a high profile match on TV. Joe looks like he's getting into better shape. That's nice to see. Hopefully that means he'll have an extended run. I feel guilty saying this. This is one of the problems being your friend. I enjoyed it. (laughs) However, you brought up nothing but good points. You make me feel bad for enjoying it. Because the truth is, I did have the thought several times, that didn't finish him off. Uh, He had to kick out of that. There was no way to do this match so he didn't kick out now. To me, that's the thing. Once you start the kickouts, you start killing things, moves, the opponent, (laughs) whatever it may be. You start killing things once you start kicking out of stuff. I enjoyed the physicality of it. You know, everything looked good. It all looked good. There was no phony bullshit work like with a Brian Cage or fucking some of these other slugs. Everything looked good. As a matter of fact, that's the problem. It looked too good. How the fuck is this even possible? <sighs> but uh, but I'll that, tell you this, but you brought up Wardlow. I have no interest in Wardlow right now. I do not want to see this guy. I, they, I hate to say that, but they've, they've made it so I don't want to. Every feud he's been involved with has been terrible. Did I see him? His hair has turned gray. Oh, I did not notice. Or his hair looked lighter. Some it was jet black, right? I don't. Maybe it was the lights. I don't know. But, but that that's what I was talking about earlier. With not every match is supposed to be a great match. Some are supposed to enhance someone's image to lead them to a great and or money drawing match. And I don't know who got enhanced here because if Darby looked like the strongest guy in the company after the first time he got beat because it took all that to beat him then he fucking gets up in joe's face and gets beat again now he's just an idiot i don't i don't he's like a baby face jason Voorhees. you think he's dead and then he just pops back up you kill him again and then he's gone until next week and he comes back and you kill him again and then you kill him again didn't jason got a couple of people before he started getting killed all the time didn't he He did. Based on how Darby's been booked and based on how popular Darby has seemingly always been, even though he doesn't have Sting right now, but he was popular before he had Sting, quite frankly. I think he's helped Sting almost as much as Sting's helped him in a way. Would it have hurt him for Joe to have beaten him in a third of the time with a lot of the same kind of physicality? Because of who Darby is, would it have hurt him at all? No, that actually would have made an impact because then people would have said, wow, Darby doesn't usually get beat that quick because if the point is to get Joe over, which apparently that was here, then that you would have done that. But as it was, it took Joe everything that he could fucking do to beat this guy and then a guy twice the size of Darby Allen, Wardlow, comes out. What the fuck? How is that... <laughs> How has that built that confrontation? Joe could barely whip Darby. Now this fucking giant beast. Instead, it's supposed to be, wow, Joe beat Darby that quick, but here comes Wardlow. But So trying to let Darby take all his goofy death wish bumps that he wants to take to show how tough he is and how crazy he is, put a lot of attention on him, which took attention away from Joe beating him because it took him forever and everything. But Joe still beat him, and then beat him again. It, ah, let's move on. Did you, you, you asked me not to skip the interview with Pockets and Pip Sabian. And clearly you skipped the Moxley one, because it was a Moxley promo earlier, too. Oh, yeah, Moxley was in the back. Where is the same place he always is? It wasn't a bad promo. I was actually going to... It was the one time I was going to say he did an all right promo, and it's the one that you skipped right past. But, yeah, I I told you you should watch this Orange Cassidy segment just because uh, we're friends. But it, it wasn't even comedy. It was funny, but not on purpose. It was like local cable access. Exactly. It was boring. Nobody gave a shit. The people speaking didn't give a shit. It was apparently setting up something for Friday that nobody's going to watch. And it was involving people that look 
ridiculous. And it was following, this was the big thing too. It was following what was at that point, one of the better shows in a long time. I'm not a big fan of battle Royals. It was over relatively quickly. MJF and Starks was a dynamite segment, uh, no pun intended, and they gave it time. And then Samoa Joe and Darby, again, cars were cr- cars were crashing. Cars were crashing. A lot of people liked it, so it wasn't just me. A lot of people by that point were saying this has so far been a pretty good show. And then you get Orange <laughs> Cassidy and Kip Sabian in a backstage confrontation that was terrible. Is there some? <sighs> Let's face it, ladies and gentlemen, Pip Sabian has been getting paid by this company apparently for three years. To do what? For who? Why? <sighs> so then they had a match where it was going to, it was, it was not only going to be, it was Claudio Castagnoli and Wheeler Useless against Jake Hager with his purple hat and Danny Garcia. And I wrote uh, right at the bell, 15 minutes of this just to see Claudio work doesn't work for me, brother. So I skipped ahead to get to the meat of the matter. Although I did notice in the course of the skipping that Jake Hager has the coordination of a sack of wet hammers. Did you see the first ever fucking spear out of a goddamn Hurricane Rana? Did you see that? <laughs> I watched Claudio, the match. Claudio goes to give him the Hur- Hager, the Hurricane Rana off the top turnbuckle. And right as Claudio jumps up and flips backwards, Hager tries to push off and his feet fly off the ropes and go out from under him. And he just goes fucking head and face first in a spear motion straight to the fucking ground over the top of Claudio. I've never seen anything like that in my life. But uh, otherwise than that, did I miss anything in this contest? No. This is like one of those things that even if you like it, you feel like you've just seen these people doing this stuff way too much. For too long. It's been months now. This Yuta, Garcia, Jericho, and Blackpool. and Well, but at least they did an interview afterwards. Because here's where I listened to Moxley. See, I knew he was going to be back. Well, I didn't want to hear him in the fucking garage with the green light again or whatever. But Tony Schiavone gets in the ring with Moxley and Claudio and Useless, and there's a sign in the back, second row, guy, I came for the sports presentation. I have a feeling he was highly disappointed. So this is where Schiavone shows the VTR of an interview that he did with William Regal, quote-unquote, a few weeks back. And they're standing backstage, and I don't know when they shot this, probably last week, I don't fucking know. But the first quote from Regal is, people are only going to see this if something bad happens to me. Like, he left a note just in case. If, if, If this all goes horribly wrong, I want people to understand why I did this. And then he tried to explain why he helped MJF and tried to put a back the backstory that they had concocted to explain how they started this, not knowing where it was going to end up, and now it's ended up with Regal's it was going to be starting back with the WWE after the first of January, as we've been talking about for weeks and weeks. Didn't surprise us. Don't know why it surprised them. Even Regal was not up to making this make sense. He was like, I realized the Blackpool Combat Club didn't need me, but I needed to show them why they didn't need me. And at one point in there, he <laughs> destroyed every bit of credibility he had. He, he uttered the phrase, Wheeler Yuta can be the best wrestler in the world. And immediately heads all over the globe exploded. And he wanted to teach them how to lead by example and to always stay one step ahead of other people, which is why he stabbed all of them in the back to turn around and aid MJF, who he... I don't fuck it. They, this who was he a suspected. square peg in a round <laughs> hole. He suspected MJF of going to do this. That's why he taped this interview before MJF did what he suspected he was going to do. But he put himself in the place to be hospitalized by MJF to prove a point to the Blackpool Combat Club that they need to stay one step ahead. Oh, mother. 
And when that VTR was over with, there was everybody in the ring just standing there and gawking. Gawking with attempted mopery. And then Moxley just launched into a promo about the Ring of Honor pay-per-view and his war with the Jericho appreciators. And I, He couldn't I, remember the date of his main event against MJF, but he could remember the Ring of Honor pay-per-view. And finally, he ended up with claiming that they were about to make a serious statement as opposed to the incoherent statement that we'd been hearing for the last 10 minutes. When this was over, did you, <laughs> you and I, we do this show for remuneration and for the glory of it. And, but we read about this shit. We keep up with it. Did you still understand even knowing that they had to rewrite all this shit and what the real story was, but did you understand any of this? It didn't make any sense whatsoever. And Moxley's face kind of told that story. You want to talk about a statement. You know what the first statement I would have made was if I was the Blackpool Combat Club? What do you mean you've been sitting on this for two weeks, Shivani? <laughs> what is that? Since when do the commentators film secret interviews that they only release upon death? When did that start? This was, this is now what, three or four exits they've given William Regal off TV. It gets, <laughs> the explanation makes less and less sense each and every time they do it. I don't understand any do you, of this. Do you think Tony's back there going, go out and say it again this week and see if he can get it right? I think he's, des I think Tony Khan is desperately trying to appease some of the people that were in the ring. And uh, I think he's trying to appease the people that like William Regal. And he's trying to even still appease William Regal and give them this ridiculous exit, which makes no sense. And... If you're going to let him out of this and screw up everything you've been booking and your main event programs and just get him off the TV already. Well, moving on with the show, we had another promo from the House of Black in the, in the dark, in the black, very spooky. All I can say is we need a lot more Julia Hart and a lot less of everybody else in that group. Moving on. The most stagey promos, the way they talk, it's like they're doing their own little horror films, their little horror speeches, not films. <laughs> horror speeches. Now it's your turn to talk. Come in. I will do something evil. Now it's your turn to talk. Yes, we are ready for evil. Like, what is this? Just be wrestlers. Oh, we're ready for evil. Oh, yeah, we're ready for evil. My friend over here is hiding in the shadows. I've been standing here the whole time waiting to walk over. What about my big friend? I, too. I'm standing in the back. Every promo they do is the stupidest promo I've ever seen until the next one. I can't disagree with any of that. But I like Julia Hart, a.k.a. Stevie Nicks. What do you think of Christy McVie passing away this past week? Well... Any thoughts? She, she was 70-something. I mean, it wasn't unexpected. She was getting up there. You a big Fleetwood Mac fan? Big Fleetwood Mac fan. Christine was okay. Stevie was the attraction of the group. What, yeah, Peter Green? The ex-wrestler, you mean, who strong-armed people? I'd like to see some actual posters of Peter Green being a pro wrestler in England in the 60s, to believe that. It's in all the, all the rock and roll books. I've never heard him talked about in the wrestling business. Peter Grant, Led Zeppelin's manager. Every biography thought, says he was a... I thought that was Peter, Peter Green or Peter Grant. You're talking about Peter Grant, I believe. And yeah. I'm referencing him now. I was talking about the Fleetwood Mac guitarist. Oh, who the fuck is Peter Green? Well, there you go. Yeah. Speaking of who the fuck are these people, we had a six-girl tag with Jane Cargill, Red Velvet, and somebody against Kiera Hogan, somebody, and somebody. They don't say their names often enough, for, and, and when I'm on speed search, I'm not going to back up and... And about the end of that match is when the audio just died, just stopped. And I'm sitting there watching the rest of the show with not a peep of audio. And the uh, uh, only thing we missed were Tony Schiavone with Britt Baker and Soraya, and with no audio, the, their previous interviews, any indication, no audio helped that. And then the tag team title match with FTR against the acclaimed. But I. I 
In all fucking honesty, we weren't going to critique this match as a match anyway. We were going to critique the finish and the fact that the match happened and what came out of the match, because all those things sucked. The finish, Cash powerbombed Caster and top spread at him, and Caster rolled through him one, two, three. The partners weren't even involved in the finish. The partners weren't even in the ring. Now they're having tag team matches where it just comes down to two guys just changing moves until one of them wins. So the finish was rotten. The fact that they had the match was rotten. We've talked about this. Okay, now it's too late to do anything about the fact that they lost a lot of opportunity with FTR. They buried them specifically because of jealousy on the part of the Buckaroos. They didn't like hearing that FTR was the best tag team. It was a shoot on the... The whole FTR, fuck the revival thing, was a shoot on the part of the smarmy little kookamonga kids from five or six years ago because they couldn't stand that the people were saying that FTR was the best team because they and their deluded, self-indulgent, masturbatory fantasies think they are. So, they get FTR in the company. They, the, the booking is insane. The push is insane. They have few wins. They somehow slip into winning the tag team titles once. They get them taken away. They start getting over organically again with the people who realize just great performance after great performance and start going, why the fuck are these guys not on TV all the time or any of the time? Why do they always get beat? Why is the one guy always in a singles match? And somehow they got over enough that they gave them all the belts for every other promotion in the world, except the one that they're on the TV of that actually counts in this environment. And the buckaroos had the opportunity to do that, which would have been right for business. But of course they didn't because they wanted to go back and play on the trampoline with their friends and twinkle toes. So they slide out of dropping the belts to FTR. They'll come back and do it later on. They'll revisit it in the future. Yeah, you lost your fucking chance. And a lot of times I've been getting a blowjob. I might have thought, well, I'll revisit this in the future. It was never as good the second time around. Nevertheless, so FTR's got every other belt in the entire world of every other company, Ring of Honor, New Japan, AAA, but the, not the AEW belts. Those then slide from a makeshift tag team that they were put on instead of FTR to the acclaimed, who are the newest team that the fans have gotten over by themselves because they love the thing with Billy Gunn. They love the scissoring. They love the rapping. They love these guys. And now it's no longer right to put the belts on FTR. But meanwhile, it is also no, not right to have this fucking match. Because not only do they... The acclaimed is a popular team, but not an experienced team. Hopefully that will come. But they're not the best wrestling tag team in this company, even though they wear the belts. So, yes, the idea would be wanting to put them against a team that has more experience, it's more professional, it's more accomplished to get a better match out of them, but not another babyface team, because then you are splitting your audience. And since the acclaimed is the hot team of the moment, it's further damage to FTR's reputation. Not only do they have to go out there not even as heels where they can fuck up their cheating and lose, but have an out, a gripe, a bitch, they have to go out there as full-fledged baby faces, split the audience. Most people going for the acclaimed, I couldn't hear. I don't know about the audio, but I bet they did. And then put them over. And in the process, it kind of shows that the real best tag team is these guys over here because they're so much farther along than the acclaimed and it's not the acclaimed's fault. If they could end this whole pissy-ass one-horse company, if they could actually put together an experienced quality heel tag team that could have matches with guys that were greener and put them over properly, that would be just swell. But instead, they continue to beat FTR. 
The only FTR can't beat anybody except in every other promotion they wrestle in where they're the champions, but nobody in, in AEW is scared of them because they lose every match except for the singles matches they have, which they lose all of those too except for Dax 1-1. He beat his partner. So then they get beat here, and then they all have to fucking hug. Because FTR's like, oh, thank you for shitting in our face, you green team that we carried through this. Now we put you over and we'll hug you. And then the ass boys appear on the screen. In the last 60 seconds of this television program, a completely unrelated tag team pops up on the screen with a Christmas card from a team that we have never seen on this television program, the Briscoe Brothers, but who have had the best tag team matches in the world over the past year with the team that just got beat by the acclaimed. And it's a challenge for a dog collar match at the Ring of Honor final battle pay-per-view that is actually going on as we are recording this. Yes, they not only made the challenge for the match 60 hours before it would actually go in the ring, but when they did that and FTR had to stand there with a dumbfounded look on their face about this news that had just been imparted to them, they threw up a graphic. And that's the last thing you saw on the TV show was Dog collar match, Saturday, FTR Briscoes, which means that not only had the match already been signed, but the information had been disseminated in a wide enough circle that the graphics department knew about it, but the people involved in the match didn't. And then they go off the air, and we had just finished a podcast that very day where we said that this Ring of Honor pay-per-view card is a joke and who's going to buy this, and at least before they had FTR and Briscoes, so there was a match that people would be willing to pay $30 or $40 to see, and they don't even have that. And so what did they do on the Wednesday night before the Saturday afternoon? Like I said, 60 hours before it would go in the ring. There you go. Here's your match to sell the pay-per-view. Announced by an unrelated team that's not in it. On behalf of a team that's not allowed on our television program because of alleged reasons, which I'm starting to call shenanigans on more and more every day. Because, you know, the Briscoes spent a lot of time in Ring of Honor with the Buckaroos, and I'm... I've been around both those sets of people, and I guarantee you that they probably wouldn't hang out together a lot outside the ring. Maybe there's some heat. Who knows? But an unrelated team issued a challenge on behalf of a team that's never been on television to the team that just got beat to be in the main event of the pay-per-view in 60 hours. Brilliant marketing, don't you think, Brian? You know, someone just emailed us before and they said, you know, I work and I don't get to watch wrestling when I'd like to at DVR and I watch it over the weekend. That fan who watches Dynamite over the weekend, they're going to hear about that main event coming right as it's probably happening. If they get to watch it on Saturday, it's ridiculous. The surprise isn't worth it because even if it had worked out well, AEW is dying in the ratings as the show goes on every week. Once you get to the women's segments that are bunched together, you're going to get a ton of people dying off that show. So this was announced at the very end of the very last segment of this show that you'd have to sit through the whole show to get through. And again, you, like you said, by a team that's not even involved and the whole buildup was stupid. And the people going to the main event are sitting in the ring, the losers, having just hugged the team that beat them. You guys and lost. Guess what? We're going to have a match for fans that really like matches. Yeah, you guys just lost, so we're going to put you in the main event of a pay-per-view. In a dog collar match? What, what's necessary? In a dog collar match that nobody's going to see to begin with because nobody even knew about this fucking match until now. And uh, somebody's going to say, well, they can plug it on the Friday night show. The one that just set the record low rating. 
Tony could have said it during his media call. I know they wanted this surprise at the end of the show, but it wasn't worth it. Especially if you don't even have the Briscoes to be able to be there. Well, besides that, he, it, obviously it's not like that this match took heaven and earth to move to get the contract signed for. So they they could have announced it four weeks ago and then filled the rest of the card in like they did last time with matches that nobody gives a shit about. Because they would have had at least something. People would have said, Okay, Dog Collar, Briscoes, FTR, all their other matches are great. I'll pay to see that match since I won't be able to see it in AEW because of reasons. Uh, but now they're expecting with two days' notice, people haven't planned in the holiday season. People ain't got nothing to do on Saturday afternoon if they even get the fucking word. They think, oh, I'll see. It, they'll do what we're going to do. We're going to watch it for free. From some unknown source. Well, don't say that. No, I will, because I want Tony to know. <laughs> <laughs> Brian Last and I would have both bought this fucking fiasco to see that match if you'd have bothered to announce it a week or two and ahead of time. But now we're going to fucking watch it for free from an unknown source that you wouldn't approve of. And all we're going to watch is that match because the rest of the show is still going to be the shits. But we might have watched the rest of it if we had a financial investment in it, but we're not going to, so we're not going to bother. For the record, I'm not guaranteeing I'm watching anything, certainly not by illegal means. But secondly, funny enough, as we are recording and as this event is taking place as we are recording, they just announced more matches. I woke up to more matches announced. <laughs> well, God damn it. The day of the show, I woke up to see, oh, another tag team match on the show. Wait a minute. Hey, Brian, Brian. Here's the thing. How many times have you gone into a whorehouse and you have paid? The I could standard? say never. Oh, come on. A whore? I, Where I, the fuck am I going to find a whorehouse? I know the family may be listening now, but, you know, just tell them to cover their ears. So you walk into a whorehouse. Okay. And you pay the standard rate for one girl. But when you get in the room, there's six girls there and they don't ask you for any more money. When has that ever happened? How many whorehouses have you been in? Well, nevertheless, and we don't need to do things. I have notes, but I can't give you an exact count unless I confer with. Nevertheless, Jesus. the point is, once people have bought something, there is no need for you to give them a bunch more shit. And if they ain't already decided on Saturday morning that they're going to watch a show that starts at fucking two o'clock in the afternoon, local time or whatever. You pretty much lost your fucking chance. Anyway, try to act like you don't go to... All right. Never but once. No I don't even know where I would find one. Well, I've, I'll give you I mean, you I know list. people I can point someone to and say, hey, if you need that, this guy could hook you up. How I have no you, idea where that shit is. How far are you willing to drive? I don't drive anywhere. Well, it, I could try to give you a list. I, you know, I mean, I guess there's bus transportation in that neighborhood. Nevertheless... <laughs> So the point is, he's this. Does it is it desperation? Is it foolishness? Oh my God! Nobody's buying this thing. I'll add a match that they'll all like, but he thinks like the rest of them do that everybody is going to know instantly everything that's happening, and they're going to just oh my God! Oh my God! This was just announced. I have to drop my entire life. Fuck the kids on Saturday afternoon. Well, don't fuck them literally. We don't advocate the fucking of children, but some. Fuck their time. Fuck their attention. I'm going to watch wrestling. Or whatever. And if you're watching NXT tonight, are you saying, hey, I'm going to double fist it. I'm going to go one right into the other. Oh, well, that's right. There's NXT business today also that we don't care about. Well, there you go. So, yeah. and then, and I guess now that, as we said, the Ring of Honor pay-per-view is going on, and people are are writing in that now they're they're maligning CM Punk at the merchandise stand. Is this why I saw this on Twitter as we took our last pee break? What's going on here? Do you have this stuff up? Uh, yeah, I see this guy here who has messaged both of us. Again, we don't know the uh, the identity of this man or exactly how true any of this is, but we'll go into the assumption that he's sending it for a reason. Jim Cornette, and Brian Last. So I'm buying merch at Final Battle. And it seems that AEW is pushing their anti-CM Punk agenda on the merch buyers and security. A security guard who is regularly at shows and a lady at the merch table 
aggressively bash CM Punk. <laughs> Very unprofessional. And then he sent us a second one. The AEW security literally said to me, quote, if he comes back, this company will end. end oh! Quote. This can't be the way Tony Khan wants his company represented. Again, very unprofessional, and makes a ticket buyer like me uncomfortable. And uh, it appears there's one more. Tony Khan, I was told by this security guard that I can, quote, go see him somewhere else when he saw my CM Punk shirt. <sighs> this is how you're running your shows? So at least one fan, I mean, we can't say it's widespread or anything, but apparently multiple people working there bash CM Punk and... Oh, well, well, wait a minute. Not only that, but the people selling the merchandise, they're still selling CM Punk merchandise, are they not? Since he's still technically under contract. As of, I believe, a couple dynamites ago, at least, because I saw a picture of the merch stand. Yeah. I believe so, yeah. So the... P and. Who's in charge of the merchandise business in AEW? Wasn't that one of the buckaroos young wives that got to be the head merchandise person? I believe it was the wife of one of the young bucks, correct. So it's funny that the merchandise people are slandering a guy on the roster still that they're selling merchandise of. Wonder where they would have... Sold more shirts than her husband did. Yeah, Since yeah. he's been there. I wonder uh, where they could have got those opinions from, those merchandise sellers, possibly from their uh, supervisors or authority figures. That's a great marketing tactic. Yeah, here we got plenty of shirts of this asshole that would end the company if he came back. You can go see him somewhere else, but buy one of these. I will say it is interesting, the quote here, allegedly from a security guard there. Again, we don't know who this guy is sending it to us, and we don't even know who he's talking about. But there has been a narrative among some there, the idea that that night CM Punk could have killed the company because of his behavior, or that CM Punk could still do a lot of damage to the company, therefore he's after our jobs. There is a little bit of that, and you could say that it's from people being fed that idea or from people just thinking it, but you know, it is interesting that this quote came from the security guard, because you are hearing some of that too, or you have at least for the last few months. Uh, well... Nevertheless, that was uh, Dynamite on Wednesday. That's a report from the ongoing Ring of Honor fiasco. And, you know, that's the thing. Now they're having these things on Saturdays. And they used to have them on Sundays, right? Now the big wrestling events are on Saturdays. That means what happens on Sunday? You get the Sunday scaries. You get that nagging feeling in the pit of your stomach, the, the feeling of impending doom, the feeling of dread, the feeling of, of the world closing in on you. That happens to you every Sunday, right, Brian? Because you know you're fixing to start a brand new week of bad wrestling. Oh, I have a week of Sundays. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I'll tell you what, folks, if your Sunday scaries are getting the best of you, you know, our new friends and sponsors at Sunday Scaries they can fix you up. Sundayscaries.com. That's where you need to go because they can fix you up for all the crap that life throws at you. Now, some people say that uh, life is scary when it's your first date and you need to fart. That's one of the examples here on the, on the uh, written material we've got. Now, that might intimidate some people. Like I've said before, I like to usually get the farts out on the first date to get a good whiff of that out there and make sure everybody's going to be comfortable with it going forward. But let's say, for example, that you've pissed off a Colombian drug cartel and you're shaking like a dog shitting peach seeds. You are scared frivolous. I'm telling you what, your spleen is turning green, your liver is quivering, and you need something to calm you down. Well, that's where the Sunday Scary CBD gummies were made specifically for alleviating that nervousness, that staring at the ceiling and worrying feeling when you can't sleep, that ability not to relax and chill. You can't shut your brain off. The Sunday Scaries are cute and delicious and vitamin-boosted CBD gummies that you pop one or 17 of these things in your mouth and you will float off into a state of bliss. Because you know what they say, ignorance is bliss, and these things will make you fucking stupid. 
So you get on. The I wouldn't say series. that it won't make you ignorant or stupid. It'll make you enjoy your day. Well, it won't make you any more ignorant or stupid really than you already are. It just might bring out the truth in you. But nevertheless, if you want to completely vacate a fully functioning human brain and just relax, sit on the couch and enjoy the colors or the temperature, take two of these CBD gummies every day to keep the scaries away. Folks, you can live scare-free. No longer will you be frightened. Let's say a giant North American brown bear searching for its cubs and very territorial, breaks through your living room window. What are you going to do? You're going to sit down with the Sunday Scary CBD gummies. You're going to give one to the bear. You're going to take one. And you're going to say, let's just talk this over, pal. No reason to get all jumpy. That's what you're going to do. So if you need to shut off your brain and chill, get over those stressful, nervous, can't sleep, dreading feelings, those oh shit moments on Sunday evenings when you have to go back to your miserable jobs and your rotten existences the next week. I'm telling you what, just, boy, just take a whole bottle of these things and just say, fuck it, leave a note. Nah, you can't do that. No matter how many of these things you take, you won't overdose. I've tried. But it's nice for relaxation. Are you going to jump in at all? <laughs> I'm over here relaxing. I just had some of my unicorn jerky from Sunday Scaries. I'm enjoying the show. Well, that's the, show. the other thing. They've got, some, they've got some amazingly named products. The unicorn jerky. And that's they've good. got, the, they got the, the, the dropper. The dropper that Stacy is appropriated. She, she does the dropper thing and, and sleeps every night like a, the sleep of, of babes. And uh, so whatever you want to do, if you get on an airplane, let's say there's a baby crying on an airplane, you got two choices. You can put a plastic bag over the kid's head and tie it off, or you can just take a couple of these gummies. Pretty much every place you come to a fork in the road in your life, you can either take a gummy or do something else. You should just take a gummy. And right now, folks, if you visit sundayscaries.com, that's Sunday, as in the day, scaries, S-C-A-R-I-E-S, dot com, and use the promo code J-C-E for your discount, you'll get 25% off. Sundayscaries.com, promo code J-C-E, 25% off. They got the gummies, they got the unicorn jerky, they've got a full line of things to help you chill out, calm down, sit back, and shut up. Well, folks, you can be scared every day of the week when you listen to the Arcadian Vanguard programming. Brian, what in the world is going on in the world of the wrestling news and all those other programs this week? Another scary yet illuminating and fun week on the Arcadian Vanguard Podcast Network. Get information about all the shows on Twitter at Super Podcasts or on Facebook at Facebook.com slash Arcadian Vanguard. Of course, if you're someone like the rest of us, you wake up in the morning and you say, you know, I really didn't feel like watching wrestling last night, but I really want to know what happened. And I don't want to sit through a bunch of audio I don't care about. I don't want to hear a bunch of eggheads like me and Jim talk about our opinions. You just want the hey. news. Well, we got a place for you. Just the facts, ma'am. Just the facts. Only the facts. Only the facts at The Wrestling News at TheWrestlingNews.com. And of course, available wherever you find your favorite podcast. Look for Arcadian Vanguard's The Wrestling News free daily wrestling newscast every morning and of course usually no longer than 10 minutes get it quick get it straight get it from a place you can trust arcadian vanguards the wrestling news once again you know that's exactly what you should do every morning a nice 10 minute quickie from a place you can trust while well, you apparently have a list of addresses about places you trust but once again the wrestling news.com is a place you can trust keep your money in your pocket no paywall, no clickbait, just the wrestling news. Of course, like I said before, information about all the shows on Twitter and on Facebook. And of course, the 605 Super Podcast, The Mothership! <laughs> I almost got it this time. I lost my voice. Get information. That sounds like my voice right now. Get information <laughs> at 605pod.com. Available wherever you find your favorite podcast. Some stuff in the works. Uh, stay tuned. The 605 Super Podcast, The Mothership.
All right. Well, before we're going to make mockery of this week's SmackDown in just a second. And there may even be an update from the Ring of Honor pay-per-view here in a second if, if, as, as we go on. But we didn't, when we talked about the AEW event a few minutes ago, we didn't talk about the ratings. And I know that they had already floated that spectrum problem, which some people may have had. I didn't at the first. I did at the end. But still, we have ratings. What story do they tell? The overall number for this past week, Dynamite, 840,000 viewers. Ouch. Down from last week, even. So where did we start and where did we end up? And is there any evidence that massive numbers of people had a problem early in the program? Or was it because we didn't hear anything on a widespread deal about later in the program? And again, I would also think that there is an issue after weeks and weeks of a certain type of TV. Certain people may be ready to tune out quicker, but let's go to the numbers here. The show opened 8 o'clock with a battle royal, 883,000 viewers. Okay, that is quite a bit down from their normal starting point. Segment 2, which was still the battle royal as well as the MJF Ricky Starks promo, that did 910,000 viewers. Okay, so it's going up. Apparently, there weren't widespread technical problems in the first 15 20 minutes of the show or it would it would have gone down not up segment three the john moxley promo that you decided not to review <laughs> and samoa joe versus darby allen eight hundred and forty five thousand viewers so we lost about sixty five thousand off of mjf segment four eight forty five the end of the samoa joe darby allen match as well as Orange Cassidy and Kip Sabian's confrontation, <laughs> and the beginning of the Jericho Appreciators versus the Blackpool folks, 876,000 viewers. So they managed to get 30,000 back up for uh, basically the Jericho Appreciators match is what was the highlight of that, highlight of that quarter hour. I don't know. I think Joe versus Darby may have been a bigger highlight for viewers. But we, we never could find out. That's just our opinions there. But the next segment, which was the 9 o'clock hour, I believe. Yeah. The end of that match, William Regal's explanation with Tony Schiavone that was lost on tape for two weeks. And then the House of Blacks promo, 882,000 viewers. So they're still hanging around there. 9.15, Jamie Hayter's interview as well as Madison Rain, Sky Blue, and Kiara Hogan versus Jade Cargill and the baddies of Red Velvet and Layla Gray, 772,000 viewers. Ouch. And, and there was still audio when this match started for me, I'll tell you that. So that was 110,000 people said, fuck it. The conclusion of that match, Britt Baker and Soraya's promo, and the beginning of FTR versus the Acclaimed, 769,000 viewers. And finally, the end of the match, the Acclaimed defeating FTR and the Gun Brothers appearing to challenge them on behalf of the Briscoes, 784,000 viewers. So they actually, uh, apparently even without audio, or maybe I was the only one, they actually, for the first time in how many weeks or how many months, the last quarter hour was not the lowest rated part of the show. It was close, but they didn't lose. The, the hundred and some thousand people were run off by the girls match instead of the six man circle jerk that they've been having. Because every time the elite pop in, they lose a hundred and something thousand people. This time they started with fewer, kept most of them until the girls got in there and stunk the joint out. And then FTR was actually able to bring uh, 12,000 back by the time it was over with and the acclaimed. If we are to read into this, that the things happening system wide and apparently in your case in different ways with Spectrum would result in issues with these numbers on this specific episode. The women lose viewers every single week, but you think the level of the drop, the 100,000, 
and the timing of maybe there were audio issues. Again, you're the first person I've heard say that. Could that have led into such a drop? Uh, well, they don't have audio issues every week, but they have that drop every week. So <laughs> point, I guess now the point is that they are starting out with fewer people than they were starting out with, and they're keeping more of those because there's fewer of them to begin with. I, I don't know whether that's good or bad, but they were only 100,000 down from the start of the program to the finish and only 126 down, thousand down from the highest point of the program, and that's better than normal, but they usually start out with a couple hundred thousand extras off the Big Bang, so maybe the Big Bang was more of a whimper this week. I... I the best thing you can say is they kept more from start to finish than they have been, but there weren't as many of them. So I don't really know how that's positive. And, you know, now I'm thinking there can't have been as widespread technical issues as people, some friendly journalists were leading us to believe, or elsewise this would have not only probably been worse, but all over the page. If no, If everybody was seeing a freeze frame for the first 15 minutes, how did they still increase their viewership <laughs> after that happened? People calling around saying, hey, you won't believe this. It's a fucking still frame on channel whatever. I, I don't know. Well, that was AEW Dynamite. We'll see if they could buck the trend and hopefully have no issues with the coverage this next week, and we'll see what happens. Well, speaking of Buck Trenderson, let's get to... Uh, uh, I didn't want to make it all AEW content on the current wrestling this week. We had some classic wrestling content, but I perused a bit of SmackDown just in that because they advertised Kurt Angle. Kurt Angle in Pittsburgh, back on SmackDown, an Olympic gold medalist, one of the biggest main event stars of the last 20 years. Certainly to God, this is going to be good or something. So I figured I'll see what SmackDown had to offer. You'll never guess how it started out, Brian, how the show started out. Uh, it would either be the bloodline or uh, it couldn't be the new day. The bloodline <laughs> ah. versus the brawling brutes. There you go. For the tag team title. The, the, this con collection of brutes was Seamus and Butch against the Us. I, I, and again, we talk about on AEW, there's wrestlers we want to see, and they disappear for months at a time. In the WWE, they got 200 people under contract. We're seeing the same 12 on every program. And it's uh, always, again, this time they just started a tag team match. They didn't have an interview first. But the Brutes and the Usos took the first 26 minutes of the two-hour program. The Usos won with their finish. And then Kurt Angle pops up on the screen in the back. He is introducing, remember Gable Stevenson, the Olympic amateur wrestling star that they've signed up? Where did we see him? Was it WrestleMania? I believe it was. We now have seen him again, standing there with Kurt Angle, where he was introduced to Brown Strongman. And Strongman's like, hey, I heard you've been down at the PC. Hey. You know, we're going to have fun. Gable Stevenson, if this was his chance to be introduced and involved in an angle with an Olympic gold medalist, I don't know if he's cruising on Lake Havasoma. I don't know if they had just woken him from a medically induced coma. He had kind of a monotone voice and a face that looked like, I don't really know what I'm doing here. I don't know if his personality is set up to be an over-the-top WWE wrestler. We'll see. They announced that John Cena will be back on SmackDown on December the 30th. So we know they're going to do a rating there, but <laughs> I hope to God it ain't his birthday because we see what happens later on with people's birthdays. L.A. Knight! They let L.A. Knight do an in-ring interview, and he's talking about Bray Wyatt. And they showed the VTRs of the past few weeks. He's been attacked, and you'll find him underneath. Remember the one week he was underneath? Like, it looked like a tornado had passed by. It left wreckage over the top of him. 
and he's always being found under shit after the attack, but he showed footage of these attacks and lurking in the background in these incidents was a man in a mask. And he knows it's Bray Wyatt, and everybody, everybody's a dummy if they don't know it, and he's going to prove it. And then the spooky video shows up on the screen again, and there's more Bray Wyatt and the cuts and the altered audio and whatever the fuck is going on and the feed your head and, you know, one pill makes you larger, the other pill makes you small. I don't know what the fuck they're talking about. And so L.A. Knight gets fed up with the creature features and he storms to the back to find Bray Wyatt somewhere. I like L.A. Knight, but now I'm just, oh, fuck's sake. The heel seems like the reasonable one in this. <laughs> then they had the Viking Raiders against the Lucha Suits. And this match went two whole minutes before B-Fab came out in the entranceway with a chair and sat down to watch, which was a distraction for the rest of Skid Row to hit the ring and beat up the Viking. And they just beat the shit out of the Viking Raiders. The angle lasted longer than the match. And then the Raiders' new girl, uh, Valhalla, she jumps on one of them, and B-Fab comes in and beats her up. And we were 50 minutes into the two-hour program from just seeing what I've just described. And then L.A. Knight was in the back looking for Bray Wyatt in the locker room area and he finds a t-shirt with, I think it was one of Bray's shirts and suddenly the lights go out and he sees a man in the mask and we go to break. I don't know what the fuck happened. So next Imperium came out to have a contract signing with Ricochet because Ricochet is going to be facing Gunther very shortly. And Adam Pierce was in charge of the contract signing, as he always is. And I said, okay, Gunther, I'm going to watch this. He's one of my favorites. And before they'd done a ding-dong thing, here came the new day. And I said, all right, my interest level has dropped drastically because I'm now not going to watch this because it's the new day and I smell a six-man tag. And they got Gunther playing with children. And Brian, you'll never guess what happened. After they did bad comedy about erectile dysfunction illusions, when the Imperium said, Gunther said, we are not entertainers, we are, we're not performers, we're wrestlers. So they took that, oh yeah, problems performing. And then they made some dick jokes. And then they got a big fight and started the six-man tag. <laughs> Oh, damn it. And then the six man tag was over when Ricochet beat Kaiser Wilhelm. And we were an hour and 25 minutes into the show. Have you missed anything yet? Have, is your mouth just salivating for all the things that you could have seen if you'd have watched this program? My mouth salivates for Omaha Steaks, not for this. Well, then we found out that Gable and Otis weren't on the list for Kurt Angle's birthday party that they're having. And everybody else is getting in and enjoying everything. It's all backstage, but they can't get in the birthday party. But then when they go later on to the birthday party out in the ring, it's just Kurt. Nobody else is there. I don't know. But anyway, before we do that, we have more miscellaneous backstage bullshit. Then we have a VTR of Lacey Evans doing the basic training that she did. She was a Marine, right? And she's doing all the, she's in the camouflage and she's running around on the logs and she's climbing the things. And it, it's a goddamn lot better than the last push they gave her, which was to stand up against a wall and talk about her horrible life and childhood. They're trying again. Then we had the team of Ronda Rousey and Shayna Baszler. Ronda Rousey, the, the most decorated female MMA fighter in history, and Shayna Baszler, who fought 
in MMA as well, and their opponents were Liv Morgan and Tegan Knox. Guess which team won? The viewers. No, nobody. Actually, nobody won. But Raquel, Raquel, Gonzalez, Rodriguez, Raquel, Raquel. Molina. That should be her name now. Raquel, Raquel. Raquel, Raquel, Gonzalez, Rodriguez, De Molina Jr. came out and distracted the heels, and Liv Morgan beat Shayna Baszler. And I'm thinking, who the fuck does Liv Morgan have these pictures of? That they are... She beat everybody. So... We now have eight minutes left on the air for this two-hour program, and we get to Kurt Angle's birthday. And in the ring, they've got cake and tables and balloons and et cetera and the whole thing. And I'm thinking, not only have they milked this till eight minutes left, which means by now they ain't got nothing good coming, and they've teased Gable and Otis, and sure enough, as soon as Angle started talking, here they could shush. And here they come at in clown outfits. They've dressed up. Otis has a clip-on tie around his neck with his T-shirt. And remember when main event stars used to come back and interact with other main event stars, and you got the, the visual of seeing Hulk Hogan and The Rock together, or, you know, Austin and some of the people that he's... It last year, Austin and Kevin Owens, for Christ's sake, at WrestleMania, at least it was something. Now you get a legend, a Hall of Famer, coming back to do eight minutes of comedy with all the underneath guys, because that's all they've got left is underneath guys. So this is just a goof segment, and they they start doing the promo and tell Kurt to get out of the ring, so he does, and they eat his cake. And after they eat his cake, Kurt says, well, you need milk with that cake. And out comes Gable Stevenson driving an antique milk truck. I mean, like from the 40s, right? The old milk trucks. And they are going to redo the Kurt Angle milk truck thing that was a play on the Steve Austin beer truck thing. So 20... Four, almost five years after the fact, and they are recreating a moment that recreated a moment. But this moment didn't have Vince McMahon as the evil Mr. McMahon or the McMahon family or top main event stars in the ring being shot with the beer hose or even shot with the milk hose and all the classic reactions of that and the fact that Austin was so over that even a preposterous was acceptable and then angle because it was funny because they did it with Austin but now it's milk instead now they've got poor Kurt 25 years later he's had injuries he can barely hold on to the fucking hose and Gable Stevenson that they're trying to give a rub here just proved that he can drive a goddamn stick shift milk truck and he has no other involvement in this whatsoever because he has the personality of fucking leaf lettuce and there's angle shooting milk at gable and otis and otis is taking he's not doing the swimming in it like mr mcmahon was the people are going crazy he's taking spin bumps in the middle of the ring for no reason off of a goddamn milk hose with not even a lot of pressure And the big story of the segment was they found an antique milk truck. It's like shit stains back. It's like he called up production, I need a Partridge family bus on Monday in Boston again, and they just do it. They've got an unlimited budget for this program because they're making more money than they've ever made, and the talent is the shits and presented in a shitty way, and they're doing parodies of angles from 25 years ago, no pun intended, angle. I, 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 <sighs> this is a shit stain. This is the Partridge family bus, all of just spending money because they can. I told you that one time, didn't I? Keith Mitchell told me that in a TNA after a TNA <laughs> production meeting one time. 
he sat down, he said, you know what the fucking idiot fucking did to us in WCW? Russo had left the room. He said, you know what the fucking moron did to us in WCW? One day? What are you talking about? When he was down there putting them out of business, he called on a Friday after, remember they were making Mike awesome, that the, the career killing gimmick they gave him, he was a 70s guy. That 70s I, guy, yeah. Yeah, because apparently Russo and dreadlock ferraro would sit there and watch 70s show reruns also so they killed his career with that he called him up on friday afternoon the production department in wcw said monday for nitro in boston we need a partridge family bus what where do you fucking you just go down to the partridge family bus store they had to move heaven and earth i think they said it cost them tens of thousands of dollars to just to find and get a Partridge family bus so this moron could see his goddamn effluvia-like writing come to life on the screen for a fucking mid-card gimmick, Partridge family bus. The same thing. We're, we're, we're not going to fucking get anybody over here. This is just going to be fucking hokey comedy on a redo of something that we did that got over years ago. But we're going to spend however much money to find an antique milk truck. Good fucking God. So that was SmackDown for you. I hope at least the milk was fresh. I'll t and that's another thing. <laughs> Boy, they're going to have to... If they don't clean that mat real good and all the mats around the ring and the all the cloth surfaces and whatever, they might as well throw them all away. Because about two days in a hot equipment truck... And that won't be anything you want to fall down on. All right. Well, are we done or well? What's the live update? Where are we at with this Ring of Honor? Crying show? over spilled milk. Is the, the is the Ring of the Ring of Honor show is apparently going on and has just started. They had an in a uh, uh, a pre show, a pre show zero hour. Jeff Cobb versus Mascara Dorada. Oh, I didn't realize Jeff Cobb was working for ring of honor nobody else did either or at least on this um, show huh. you got daddy mac mac daddy and cool hand luke from the jericho appreciators against the uh, i'm not i'm not making this up the team apparently is called the shinobi shadow squad comprised of cheeseburger and eli isom which i believe is, he's a cousin to gavin newsom what? Then, and Cheeseburger's a comedy wrestler, right? Well, he's a night. He used to be on the ring crew when I was there about twelve years ago, and and he trained diligently with Delirious, and he's a great kid. But yeah, he's very painfully thin, and his name is Cheeseburger. So, you got that going for you. Um, Willow Nightingale versus Trish Adora, and oh wait, this is still the pre-show. Guess who's on the pre-show? <laughs> on the goddamn Ring of Honor pay-per-view. Matt Taven and Mike Bennett, the Kingdom tag team against Top Flight, the Martin brothers. Oh, wow. Matt Taven and Mike, that's right. They signed them about, what, four or five, six weeks ago, and we've never seen them yet. And I told you they're going to get stuck in Ring of Honor. You said, no, they're AEW. They're not going to be Ring of Honor. Look what well, happened. Well, there you go. Okay. The pre-show. Not even the pay-per-view, the pre-show. Remember I just said experienced quality heel team that could have a match and put the acclaimed over and not further destroy what's left of FTR Matt Taven and Mike Bennett and because they're full-fledged heels they could have fucked up on their teamwork the acclaimed could have won everybody had been happy nobody would have been damaged but instead they're over here on the pre-show of a pay-per-view that nobody's going to buy on a Saturday afternoon at three o'clock in the middle of fucking nowhere so there's another, well, there's some more names that we can talk about when we talk about how we never get to see the good wrestlers, Taven and Bennett, that the, they presented that fucking show this past Wednesday night, and these two guys weren't even on it. Good God. All right. Well, that's the update I've got on the, uh, the doings in Dallas. You know what the problem is overall? And I'm not trying to, don't just turn this into an insult fest, which you will. Okay. But because AEW has been able to get really impressive pay-per-view buy numbers, 
make good money off some live gates and the pay-per-views because people want to see a, there's an audience for the kind of matches they're putting on no matter what the TV is and because of that too many people ignored the fact that the TV is terrible and it's been since the beginning mostly just nothing makes sense things happen then people are gone people disappear off the TV random people show up people show up and you're supposed to think they're a big deal you've never seen or heard of them before all of these things have been happening since the beginning it's just now people are noticing them more and saying them about the AEW booking problems and it extends to Ring of Honor cuz they had a pay-per-view here just assume they're part of AEW and AEW should be building up the pay-per-view even that's been just bungled in every conceivable way like at what point are people going to realize I know he got voted Booker of the Year a couple times, but the AEW TV booking has not been good wrestling TV. Well, again, Booker of the Year. You know, I've I used to think, wow, I won that two or three times, whatever it was, and now it's like Jesus Christ. You know, can't even be proud of that anymore because apparently anybody can do it. I know the audience that. Uncle Dave appeals to has changed over the years. It used to be the people who liked really good wrestling, and now it's the people who like really fucking silly modern wrestling. The wrestling must be silly and fun crowd. That's the audience he has left. That's the audience AEW has. The problem is, again, we've determined the size of that audience. It's 750 to 900,000 people on Wednesday night, give or take, except when they have punk or a big fucking goddamn hotshot angle. And then it goes back. And the pay-per-views, yes, they're doing better pay-per-view buys than anybody since WCW. There actually hadn't been anybody except TNA really doing pay-per-views since WCW. And TNA was... Unfortunately, the victims of the prior administration or prior generation's worst booker in the world. Uh, and pay-per-view was the way to make money was completely not his interest at all. It was his crash TV. But now we're seeing that they've been buying these pay-per-views from the start, no matter who's on them, practically, no matter what fucking the booking is like, because they want to support the company. And we mentioned this, I said four years ago, the first all-in was the world's biggest ever crowdfunding wrestling event. The people willed it into success. And they've been trying to support them since then. And they do the same pay-per-view buy rate numbers, except Punk came around and brought an extra 50000 once or twice or whatever the fuck it was. But the audience is not expanding. It's contracting slightly on television. It's staying about the same, if not contracting a bit, on pay-per-view because they lost Punk and he was the the one touchstone of, wow, we remember when this shit was actually popular and he was a part of the big company. But uh, by now, the thought is we we should be seeing bigger numbers, some type of expansion of something. And now I think it's coming down to how much money do people have? How much money can they continue to spend to that dedicated audience of, as I said, a million that'll watch TV or a little less and 150,000 or a little less that'll buy the pay-per-views. How long can they go on not getting any more out of it than what they're getting? They're starting to dribble people off just by now, like you said, well, we've lost some talent or we lost some interest or this stuff really doesn't make a lot of sense or just we've seen everything. There's nothing else they can fucking do to a human body. So that's what they've got to worry about. There's no interest in the personalities except for MJF and and. You know, the acclaimed, we'll see whether that lasts. Do, uh, will the booking let it last, or will they cool off like everybody else that's gotten over because the fans got bored and decided to get somebody over? That cools off quick when it's not taken care of. Wardlow, everybody. Everybody. Where's Eddie, so, where's Eddie Kingston? Well, who, maybe he's in anger management again. But the, the point is... It, it, 
they're not only not doing a lot to give the people that have been with them from the start any more reason otherwise than we want this thing to go to stick with them. And they're not drawing anybody else in because it's just a fucking mess and nobody can keep track of what's going on. So uh, again, just if it's simple, chances are people will understand it. I know that Tony's mind for whatever reason works in all these weird, convoluted, detail-oriented ways, but you've lost a lot of people, Tony. It may make sense to you, but we can't figure it out. Nobody else can either. It don't make sense. So instead of booking for the thousands of invisible fans in your eFed that give you good feedback, why don't you try getting somebody else to book for the ones that might watch your program if they had a shit clue what the fuck was going on? Here's a live report from Ring of Honor Final Battle. Right now in the ring, Athena having a very stiff match with Mercedes Martinez. The fans really behind Athena. Well, of course they are. And of course she is. And there you go. Ha! Well, we're not going to stick around to see the finish of that one, are we? No, I think enough. Enough. All right, enough. Next one's your program, right? The drive through That's right. The always fun and always illuminating and sometimes scary drive through this coming week whenever we put it out. Well, I'm glad you painted us into a corner like that. All right, folks. Well, we hope we had some classic wrestling to go along with the current stuff. And until the drive through and next week on The Experience and Christmas is coming, so is winter. Thank you, fuck you, and bye-bye, everybody.